So it's my pleasure to to introduce Alessandro Rudi, so who is going to be the first lecture of a, a series this week. And he's going to talk about representing non-negative functions with applications to non-convex optimization and beyond. Alessandro, thank you. Thanks, Augusto and Simone and the other organizers for the invitation and uh, Centro Giorgi. So, yes, representing non-negative functions with applications to non-convex optimization and beyond. So I will do um, first a few, few minutes, so let's say half an hour, 40 minutes of presentation to give, uh, let's say, a broad idea of what we are going to do, why we need this kind of models. And then we will go in the rest of the of the classes to see more uh, more the details, the mathematical details, how do we obtain all the proofs and everything. So what do we talk today about is representing non-negative functions. So, uh, so what we worked on in the last uh, few years in my group in, uh, in Paris with Francis Bach and other colleagues is a way to represent a non-negative function that is not only very elegant from a mathematical viewpoint, but allows to bring the same benefits that uh, linear models that you already have seen like kernel methods or uh, shallow neural network, the same uh, benefits that those models bring to uh, and brought to important fields of applied mathematics, like interpolation, approximation, quadrature, machine learning, and to do this to other fields that are very important of applied mathematics, like uh, uh, non-convex optimization, optimal transport, uh, uh, probability representation, and inference. So I guess that, uh, and also they are a nice extension of, uh, uh, let's say, if you want, the theory of uh, kernel method could be a good starting point for a master course. Uh, so this is a work that we uh, started two years ago, and, uh, like uh, uh, during par pandemic idle time with uh, Ulysse, our PhD student with Francis. And then uh, we explored uh, with a growing number of colleagues all over the, over the world. So we said uh, linear models, okay. Uh, so the, um, they have been, uh, uh, I'm sure you've already seen this kind of, uh, of, of models, and they have been the workhorse to solve and to obtain flexible and effective uh, numerical methods in many fields of applied mathematics. Here I just reported a few. Uh, so just to say in the slides, I will go fast because I will present in 40 minutes everything all the things and even a bit more uh, that we will see in the rest of the classes. So you will have mathematical questions. I will I will do statements without proofs, okay? And this is exactly the goal to, to, to give a thread of ideas, okay? And then we will, uh, so once we see all the path, then we can walk together to, to see all the details, okay? So if you have uh, technical questions, the answer is yes. The, the details are not here. We will see them later. If you have instead more uh, philosophical questions, so why we are doing this and not something else, this is a good place to ask. Okay. So linear models are effective and they've been effective. I, I don't know if you have courses of numerical analysis for many fields of uh, applied mathematics. And here we are talking about solution of PDs like meshless methods, finite element methods, quadrature and integration, interpolation, and approximation, machine learning. So in all those fields, you have seen somewhere when you want to obtain algorithms that you fit uh, functions with this kind of models, and then use this model to solve the problem at hand. And so why this has been so effective? So when I say, when I describe a linear model, I'm talking about a linear combination of a bunch of nonlinearities. So let's take uh, a set of nonlinearities that you like. So I don't know, a truncated Fourier series. So few uh, elements of the Fourier basis, few elements of a wavelet basis, or here more general, you can take uh, a kernel function. So G could be a kernel like uh, the Gaussian kernel where you fix one entry and you leave the other entry free. Okay, so this is a function in one, uh, in one variable. So the elements here is fixed. 
and you just take the linear combination of those nonlinearities and the parameters that you are going to optimize are the theta. Okay, so why those linear models have been so effective? For two main properties. So linearity in the parameters brings fle flexibility. So here you see the parameters center linearly, and this is crucial because it, it allows to optimize very easily fa uh, convex functionals. Okay, so you have a, a function that is convex. You plug this, and uh, you want to find uh, a function that minimizes this functional, okay? And uh, if you plug this model inside, you just obtain now a uh, convex problem in the parameters, okay? So you preserve convexity. You can use all the beautiful methods you have seen in the past days or in other courses to optimize this kind of functions. And it is interesting also because you are going from a, a, an optimization over, infinite, over an infinite dimensional space, that is the space of the functions of interest, to a problem that depends only on a, of a number, on a discrete and finite number of parameters. Then, so flexibility in terms of problems, but also in terms of quantities that you can control, because, for example, you can compute easily all the linear operators of interest of a, uh, of a linear model. For example, uh, you want to compute the integral, you can do it in closed form if uh, G is easy enough, okay? And uh, it is trivial, you have the integral here, you just bring it inside and you compute the integral of G over the measure you are interested in, okay? And so it allows you to express easily functionals also with respect to properties like uh, integrals, derivatives, or other linear operators of interest over your function. So this accounts for flexibility if you want. And then you have efficiency because uh, we have seen before that you obtain a problem in n parameters, but how much must be n to approximate well a function of interest? If n is huge, then uh, it, the method is not really interesting because you cannot run it. The good thing is that linear models under uh, mild assumptions over the nonlinearity you choose have what it's called, con uh, you can call it concise approximation. So uh, a few number, a small number of units, n, is enough to approximate a class of functions of interest, typically a large class of functions. So here I report uh, a prototypical example of this kind of results from, uh, this is a very nice book I suggest uh, to read from one time in your life, uh, Scattered Data Approximation of Wendland. And the idea is uh, uh, that you can approximate, so here uh, you have a function that is m times differentiable. How many units you need here to approximate uh, this function up to error epsilon? And uh, uh, the typical answer is that you need the number of units that is in the order of epsilon minus d over m. So d is the dimension of the space. m is the order of differentiability of your function. And this opens to very important application because if you are uh, optimizing or you are working with a function that is very uh, regular, so m is big, you see here that uh, you are avoiding the curse of dimensionality. So if, if m is larger than d, you, a number of units in the order of epsilon minus one is enough to achieve error epsilon, okay? And so this means that if you want to um, double the precision, you have only to double the number of points. This number does not grow exponentially, okay? So this opens the... Uh, uh, the possibility to work on application with big dimensions, okay? L with large dimensions like in, uh, uh, in machine learning, okay? And so, and this is the reason why, for example, kernel methods or shallow neural networks works in, uh, uh, in problems with dimensions in the order of thousands, okay? Then of course, if you go to millions, if you go over images, you need to include uh, additional structure. Okay, so we have seen uh, linear uh, linearity and concise approximation. One accounts for flexibility, the second for uh, efficiency. 
this picture globally seems very, very interesting and indeed uh, unlocked uh, very, very effective algorithms for, uh, yes. Um, a question. Um, the constant then in uh, the big O depends uh, on D? This is, or... uh, yes, so this is very important. So this one is, uh, so it is epsilon minus D over M in the rate. So epsilon is the error you want to achieve. There is a constant in, in this big O that you are going to pay. And typically it's in the order of, uh, this, uh, this is an approximation constant is the order of D factorial. Okay, and uh, well, you can imagine because you can, uh, so in this space minus one, one to the D, you can encode uh, functions that for example, on the vertices of hypercubes uh, can uh, represent any binary string. So you have a complexity and you need the number of units that in a sense accounts at least this kind of complexity. So unless you restrict the class of functions, you cannot avoid this kind of, of constants in front. And this is important because it means that uh, if you want to represent a general function in this space, uh, you have a kind of threshold. You, have a, you need the number of units that uh, starts paying the constant. And then after this, the error will go down very fast with this rate. OK. so. This is a very beautiful picture. The fact is that not all the problems can be represented with linear models. For other problems, we need more structure, okay? And so here I do just a list of few, few examples. And we have uh, probability representation, uh, Bayesian inference, non-convex optimization, optimal transport, uh, other, other problems. So, why linear models are not enough? Well, here, let's take probability representation that is the easiest. So here we want to represent a, a, prob a probability density. This is a function, okay, that's cool. We could use linear models in principle. We need to control the integral, must be equal to one, we can do it. But we need this function to be pointwise, non negative. So how can we guarantee this with linear models? In general, we cannot. If we choose uh, uh, some weights, we cannot guarantee that there are no regions where the function is negative, okay? Then of course, some, uh, so we can, we have considered approximation, linearity in the parameters, non negativity, but the non negativity is not guaranteed for linear models. So we have uh, in the literature, few methods to represent non negative functions. And they go under uh, two main classes, if you want. Ridge models that consist in mapping the, uh, the linear model that gives you a real uh, or, a, or a complex number in output to the um, uh, non-negative uh, semi-axis. Okay, so you can take, for example, the exponential of a, of a, of a linear model. Or mixture models. You take the same shape of the linear model, but you restrict the parameters and the functions. So for example, you take functions that are always non-negative, like Gaussians, and you restrict now the coefficients to be non-negative too. Okay, so you have those two options. And those two solve some problems, but incur in, in other problems. So neither of them have both properties at the same time. For example, ridge models, you can prove that they still have concise approximation. So few units are enough to approximate the function of interest, but you lose linearity in the parameters. So this function itself is not linear in the parameters anymore. This means that in general, if you plug them in a convex functional, the result is not guaranteed to be convex unless you are using very specific loss functions. Yes. Yeah, sorry. No, yes. What, what is like the conceptual reason behind that the linear models cannot be non-negative? Well, if you take this, okay, you you take uh, g to be non-negative, and you leave uh, theta to be a real number. 
in general, either you have all the, uh, the thetas non-negative themselves, like in the mixture models, or if there are thetas that are negative, there could be regions where the, um, the, the, um, uh, the element with the negative coefficient will, pre uh, will be um, larger than the others. And so the function can go negative in that part. But, but if you restrict like the, this, the searching space? And it, it is exactly that's... what we are going to discuss here. If you ah. restrict uh, now theta to be non-negative, what happens? And we will see that you lose concise approximation. But, but, but this is just like the sufficient condition, no? because you can anyways obtain positive and negative, but overall. Hey, but how do you guarantee this? Yeah, I mean, in, in the constraint of the optimization problem, no? Like you already posed it as a constraint optimization problem. Exactly, so but then. The whole function is positive. But how do you guarantee this? So you need the, the, you have to check any x. You cannot do it uh, only a few. So if you do it only a few points, you guarantee that uh, on those 1,000 points you have checked, I see, I see. it's not negative. But, but in the rest, is... you don't know if in the middle it will go negative. Yeah. Okay. And actually, if you optimize this, uh, you are forcing the function to go negative where you don't see, because it, it will be the place where maybe it allowed to reduce some functionals and so on. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so thank you. Okay, so let's finish here one second on, on, on ridge models, like exponential models. So in general, it's not clear if your, if your functional is convex, but even if it is convex, it's difficult to, it's not linear in the parameters, the whole structure. So it's difficult to do things like computing the integral. You have to resort to more elaborated algorithms that sometimes are exponentially slow, like MCMC, okay. Uh, so this is for each models. Mixture models, on the contrary, uh, keep the same structure. So the parameters enter linearly in the formula, but unfortunately what you lose is concise approximation. And let's see why, let's give an example. So let's see that, uh, let's assume that we take G to be a Gaussian function, okay? With a fixed uh, width. Now what, we are, what the model does is adding adding up Gaussians, one over the other, okay? So if you want to learn, if you want to represent the green curve here, we would need a Gaussian of a width, if you want to represent the small peak here, of a width that is smaller than the peak, the, the green peak, because we are just standing up. If it was larger, we would never recover the small one, okay? So we need the peak with the width that is the blue one, but this means that if we, this kind of Gaussian, we have to fill the large uh, peak. We would need uh, a large number of Gaussians proportional to the volume. And so you can prove that uh, you need a number of uh, Gaussians, uh, uh, blue Gaussians in the order of epsilon minus D over two. So, and this is well known uh, in uh, fields like kernel density estimation. So if you just take uh, non-negative functions with non-negative weights. You have a non-negative function in output, but you need to approximate the, the density of interest, the number of units that is epsilon minus d over two. So uh, you pay the curse of dimensionality and you are not adaptive to the regularity, okay? The only way to avoid this is for if for some magic, you know exactly the width that your Gaussian must have in each point. And in general, uh, it, it is equivalent to learning another non-negative function. So you are not simplifying the problem. Okay, so before going on, let's consider instead, how would you fit this with the linear model, okay? If you want to fit this with the linear model, you see that the best curve, the best Gaussian to, to use is the one in, uh, in red that has a, a width that is larger indeed of the smallest peak. So how could you approximate the small peak with the large Gaussian? Okay, so this is, uh, this is interesting. And the, the thing you see is that you can do this via cancellation. So you put few Gaussians here, one with a positive weight, one with a negative. And so you will approximate well the small peak and you will have a, a, some oscillations around zero. So around zero, you will go below. Okay, so indeed your function 
will have regions where you go below zero, but you can approximate very well this part. This also tells you that you cannot have optimal rates without cancellations, okay? So we need, uh, if you want a model that approximates, that is linear in the parameters and approximate uh, with optimal rates our functions, we need some form of cancellation, okay? And so thinking uh, about this kind of reasonings, uh, we arrive to this model that if you want is a generalization of a linear model. You see that instead of a vector here, we have a matrix A that is uh, uh, N by N and it, it is positive semi-definite. And our, our model is defined as the linear combination of the, met the element IJ of the matrix A times our our I nonlinearity times our J nonlinearity. okay? So, you can see this as, so if you just stack all the nonlinearities in a vector, like a vector phi, you can write this as phi of x transpose A phi of x, okay? And since A is non-negative, as a positive semi-definite, you see that by construction, F of A in x is non-negative for any x, okay? So you have non-negativity. You have still linearity in the parameters because they enter linearly, as you can see here. And this is good because uh, now, since it's linear, you can, uh, you can optimize, for example, functionals over non-negative functions, okay? Let's say functionals over probabilities. You don't have to worry anymore that your function will go below zero because it cannot. And your problem is still convex. Because now, if you plug uh, this model inside that we call the PSD models, because it's based on PSD positive semi-definite matrices, you will have a problem that is uh, convex over the SDP, the family of SDP, uh, the PSD matrices. So this is a convex set, the convex of PSD matrices. So the resulting problem is an SDP problem, semi-definite programming problem. And again, you can compute linear operators in closed form. So you, you know how to do the integrals of this in closed form. And this is again trivial. You put the integral here, it will go inside. It. So if you are able to compute the integral of the product of two nonlinearities, that's it. You can compute the integral over the whole function. And uh, in general, if you take simple functions like Gaussians, you know how to do this. Okay, but we have the original question. Do we have consensus approximation here? So this is the point. And uh, note that this model is richer than before. So if you want a mixture model here, you choose A to be diagonal. If you take A to be diagonal, you will have uh, a sum of non-negative terms non-negative coefficients times gx xi to the square, okay? That is a, a mixture model. But this is more general. You can take matrices that are generally PSD, so you can have, ne you can have negative coefficients. So if you take the matrix one minus one minus one one, this is PSD, but it has negative coefficients. So you allow here a restricted form of cancellation. So is this enough? to achieve uh, concise approximation. So if you want, this is the question that uh, we are going to see. And I reported here a super simple proof to show that uh, this model is already more general than uh, exponential models. So rich models where you choose the exponential and we know that they, are, they have already concise approximation. Then we will see more details on how large is our class, okay? So our goal here is to approximate concisely a function that is exponential of a uh, m times differentiable function, okay? So we represent, uh, so this is the goal and, and uh, we want to represent it with a PSD model, possibly with a small matrix, okay? So we take our function f, that is the exponential of uh, v, where v is m times differentiable. 
we define H that is the square root of F. And we know that F itself is n times differentiable. Why? Because we can write it as an exponential of V over two. V is n times differentiable, V over two is n times differentiable. We apply the exponential, we can still derive the same number of times, okay? Now, H is n times differentiable. We have seen uh, the, the fact that linear models are considered approximators. And we have seen the rate for it. So let's fit now H with the linear model, any linear model we like. I don't know, with the truncated Fourier basis, with the Gaussian kernel, whatever. We will obtain F of small a, small a is a vector of this form, where n, the number of units, is epsilon minus d over m. We are just applied the theorem we have seen before. And that's it. Now we can already build the PSD model. We want F of capital A to be equal to F of small a to the square. And we can obtain this by choosing the matrix A to be the vector A times A transpose. So this is a rank one matrix. This is PSD. And then, so F of A, F of capital A is equal to F of small a to the square. F is equal to H square. You can see by, uh, 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 well, by just uh, rewriting the difference of two squares that this one is proportional to the norm of H times epsilon, okay? And so this model F of capital A approximates F with an error epsilon, proportional to epsilon. And the model itself is, uh, it depends on a matrix N that is of dimension epsilon minus D over M. Because, uh, so, and you, if you want, you inherit from the linear model that approximates H, the nonlinearities and uh, the coefficient uh, that are in the matrix A. And note that here we just used the rank one matrices. Okay, so uh, can we do better than this? Can we represent other, other uh, uh, well, more general functions? Okay, so uh, maybe we will derive those conditions explicitly uh, the tomorrow or the, the next day. So we have seen that uh, we can uh, consistently approximate uh, function that are uh, expon um, the exponential of some regular function, so an exponential model. More generally, you can prove that uh, you can do any function that does not touch zero, because here we talked about exponential of v, but the whole story works for any function that has a regular square root. You take a function, it has a regular square root, you can do the same reasoning, okay? So any function that does not touch zero, allow you to, to, to do the same. Why? Because square root uh, far from zero is all infinity. So you can uh, compose it. But also you can touch zero. So what we proved is that uh, if your function touches, and uh, you can do all of them with uh, PSD models that are rank one, okay? Here instead you need a rank that is larger than one. In particular here you need, you need the rank that is D plus one for your matrix A. And um, so you can decompose with the, um, we can approximate efficiently with the PSD model, any function that uh, is non-negative and uh, it touches zero in a finite number of places. And in each point, the Hessian, where it touches zero, the Hessian is strictly positive, okay? And why, just to give an idea, so why we need, the, so here, the, this condition and this condition are conditions on the regularities of the set of zeros, okay? This second condition, so we can efficiently approximate a, 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 a non-negative function with the PSD model when the non-negative function is a set of zero that is a C1 manifold and the, um, the Hessian in the direction orthogonal to the manifold is strictly positive. So why those kind of regularities? Because if you want to generalize the, the proof that we have seen before, we need to 
show that our function can be written as a sum of squares. Okay, so we, we must prove that there exists a square root that is smooth. In general, if you take x square and you do the trivial square root, you obtain the uh, absolute value of x. This is not smooth in zero. But you know, actually, that there exists another function whose square gives you x squared, that is exactly x. And this one is, uh, uh, is differentiable all the times you want. So in general, you can prove that there are counterexamples of functions, a bit pathological, that uh, move a lot around zero. And there you can, uh, does not exist a square root beyond the, uh, a function that is uh, C1 plus epsilon around, uh, around zero. So, uh, so you need some regularities of the zeros in particular. So the proof here is a generalization of uh, uh, the, the parametric Morse theorem. So around zero, you show that uh, the fact that the Hessian is strictly, uh, strictly positive allows you to, let's say, to do a local decomposition in terms of the, the functions of the Hessian, and uh, this helps you. Okay. So now I've said that, yes. Um, so we have seen that we just need a, like n um, number of functions, right? And mm -hmm. we have concise approximation. Um, but what we are doing a, a quadratic number of evaluations, yes. right? Because we have a matrix. Does this uh, cause problems in practice or does it work? Indeed. So, so the difference here is that you need to, to, to deal with the matrix. Note that uh, in all the examples, uh, sorry, in all the examples I produce, uh, you have a number, so you need matrices that have a rank that is fixed uh, depending on the target function. So it does not depend on N. Mm -hmm. And in particular here, the number of zeros in the construction we do is, uh, uh, sorry, the number, the, the rank of our matrix is proportional to the number of zeros times D plus one, okay? And here, instead, in terms of how, in how many parts you can decompose, like in the witness decomposition of your manifold. So uh, those are fixed numbers, but uh, in, in any case, uh, can be larger than n, the n that you have at the moment. So there are situations where your matrix will be really full rank. Mm -hmm. OK. So in that case, you cannot do better than uh, than uh, uh, using, uh, like, uh, let's say, the matrix uh, formulation. Okay. okay. Then, of course, the question is, can we, uh, if our n is way larger than uh, the rank of the matrix, can we do better than this? And this is a, uh, a very interesting question. Let's say that uh, if you want to keep convexity and the problems easy, then I would say well, there is no... Uh, trivial way to do this. Of course, you could uh, always represent your non-negative, your, your PSD matrix with the burer montero decomposition. So as uh, a low rank, de so your matrix A as uh, B transpose B, where, where B is low rank. Mm -hmm. And in this case, you would need uh, way less parameters, mm -hmm. but you lo lose convexity. So mm -hmm. this depends. Uh, uh, so if, I see a non-trivial trade-off here. So if you want convexity, you need the full rank matrix. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I say the, um, this kind of model could really help in uh, other interesting problems of applied mathematics beyond uh, interpolation, quadrature, approximation, machine learning. Let's see some example, for example, non-convex optimization, okay? And uh, so to understand a bit the idea here, so we started actually, so historically, this is the motivation for which we started to explore this kind of model, is that there, there are very interesting results from the 80s, from uh, Eric Novak and his group, that uh, the problem of uh, optimization is equivalent to the problems of approximation in terms of function evaluations. So it means that to achieve an error epsilon in approximation or in optimization, when I say optimization is uh, if you want to find the global minimum of a function up to the error epsilon, you need a number of evaluation. You cannot avoid a number of evaluations of your functions that is the same order of the optimal approximation 
that you need to achieve the same error. And this is a very general result that holds for any set of functions that is, uh, uh, let's say, a convex Banach set that is also symmetric. Okay, so in general, so CM has also those properties. So this means that you cannot, uh, uh, so to achieve a epsilon in optimizing a, a, a function, non negative, a function that is m times differentiable, you need to observe this function at least epsilon minus d over m. And you see that this is also then a lower bound on the computational complexity because you need to do at least epsilon minus d over m operations before finding the, the global minimum of this function. This number we have already seen it. it is, it's uh, the, uh, the rate for um, approximating with error epsilon a function that is m times differentiable. This result shows a symmetry between the two problems and equivalence at a very profound level. What was striking me is that actually the two communities are not so symmetric. In the communities, in the community of approximation, we have very well established results that achieve uh, error epsilon with the optimal number of evaluations that are very, very effective from a computational viewpoint. We cannot say the same in the field of non-convex optimization. We don't have algorithms with uh, this kind of, uh, so that achieve error epsilon with probably a computational complexity that is proportional to this one, okay? And in general, we, are, we, are, we have worse results than that. We have either algorithms with no guarantees to convergence that are more heuristic. So you have uh, your hyperparameters of a neural network. Uh, you want an algorithm that brings you somewhere fast, some good solution. You don't care if it is the global optimum. You don't want even to prove it. Or you have uh, algorithms with provable guarantees that are in the order instead of epsilon minus d over two. Okay, so you pay fully the curse of dimensionality. Uh, 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 not taking into account even the, the regularity of your function. Okay. So, so our idea was, can we symmetrize the situation? Can we bring, especially using this kind of uh, equivalence between the two problems, we can we bring results from approximation theory to improve the uh, computational complexity of optimization method? Okay. So uh, let's start uh, from uh, the prototypical non-convex non optimization problem. So we have a function h. It's not the h we have seen before. Just uh, wanted to use the same notation to, to confound you. So uh, we have h is m times differentiable function. We want to do unconstrained optimization over this open set. Okay. The, see, the, the first thing we do is that we massage the problem, writing the classical convex characterization for the problem. Instead of finding the minimum of H, we find here the highest hyperplane that is always below H, okay? So it will go up until it will touch the, uh, the, the minimum of the, the global minimum of the function, okay? So, the, the level of the hyperplane is represented by the constant the, 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 uh, the constant C, okay? That must satisfy for any point X, the fact that H of X minus C is non-negative. So this problem is convex. You see that is, uh, um, well, we are optimizing one variable and we have a set of inequalities that are linear inequalities in the same variable. So it is a convex problem. It is just a rewriting of the previous one. You see that all the complexity of the problem now is in the dense set of inequalities. So for any point X, we have to satisfy this, okay? So first thing I do, if I see something dense, is say, okay, let's discretize it. What happens, okay? So what happens if we discretize this set? Well, we see that uh, discretize is not enough. Discretizing is not enough. We need to do something more. Indeed, if we discretize this set, we see immediately that this is a fancy way just to write the solution C8 that is the minimum of the, our functions 
in the points xi that we have selected. So we select 10 points, we discretize our uh, set of inequalities, we just take the inequalities over the set of points. If you solve this problem, you just obtain that uh, you are selecting the minimum of your functions on your set of points. Is this algorithm good? Well, you know that if you let this number go to infinity, you will eventually find the global optimum. So in principle, it could be a good algorithm. But let's see which is the rate of the algorithm. So uh, let's take those points to be in a grid, OK, for simplicity. Uh, and we take our function to be uh, any function that is at least m times differentiable. So if you put your points, um, um, so if you take your function, okay, that satisfy your, uh, uh, the set of inequalities for all points, in the worst case, you can have this situation. So your, your, func your, um, uh, your points are at a, a grid of uh, scale tau. Your function is, uh, uh, is always above the points in the grid except in two points where it touches exactly zero. So you see that you can always have this situation where your function is local is like a parabola. It touches zero in two points. The points are at distance tau and your function can go down up to tau square. Okay, so this is the error you are incurring in. If you call this epsilon, okay, you see that in, in, the, in the hypercube there are tau to minus d points, okay, the error is tau square, you see then that the number of points exp expressed with respect to epsilon are exactly epsilon minus d over 2. And this is the worst case it can happen, so you cannot beat this rate. So this kind of algorithm, irrespectively of the smoothness of the regularity of your function, cannot do better than epsilon minus d over 2. Okay, so discretizing is not enough. You need something more. Do you have questions? No. Thanks. Um, just a question. Uh, how did you choose tau, a priori? I choose, uh, I choose tau. I choose a grid. I have a budget of n points. Okay, but, okay, I but, put a grid in my space. Okay, but then I don't get why you 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 get only tau squared. I mean, you if you multiply h by I don't know one hundred, you still uh, uh, h is still zero on the yes two yes. So you take a, a ball of functions. Okay, <laughs> I don't know m times differentiable up to a given norm. Okay, mm -hmm. up to norm one. Okay, yes. In those functions, in those set of functions, you have the parabola. Yes, this parabola. Okay, mm -hmm. multiplied by the constant of the radius of the ball you choose. And so you have the norm of the function times uh, this, uh, this tau square. Because... Uh, okay, okay. And so you, you are indeed this deo term. So here you would have, let's say, the norm of the, of the ball of the space of functions you're taking. Okay, so in a sense, in the, in the choice of tau, there is the hidden the a sort of a Lipschitz constant of the gradient of, of h somehow? Yes? Yes. Okay. But you see that uh, it is the only quantity that matters because then you can always have this case. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there is no possibility to leverage uh, uh, regularity properties of the functions. Uh, of course, if you let this uh, Lipschitz constant go into zero, uh, you will... Uh, but you just you are optimizing constant functions in the end. So this is why you could fix to one because it is a scale invariant with respect to this. So if you have uh, that norm, that the norm will appear. Uh... Okay, so we need something more. Yes. Time is it? Uh... Uh, you, have, uh, you have spoken about the duality between approximation and optimization mm -hmm. before, but, but uh, when you say approximation, you say we want to approximate uh, the, let's say, the infinity norm, for example, of the function. Yes. And with optimization, you say I want the minimum of the function. The minimum yeah. of the function, yes. Okay. 
And so yeah. in one case, in optimization, the minimum of the function is, so the error is the distance between the, the, uh, the, the value of the function in the point that I think is the global minimum and the function okay. where the, the value of the function in the actual global minimum. So it's the distance of Okay, okay but so to, to, to try to find the minimum, you could approximate uh, the function with uh, the approximation on algorithm, to, algorithm that you said that is efficient uh, and you can estimate the minimum. How do you estimate the minimum then? You have an approximation of H, let's say. You approx uh, so let's do this. You take H, yeah. you, you see it in endpoints, you approximate it using uh, know, linear models okay. or whatever you like. But then how do you find the global minimum? You have to do a still a the optimization over H hat, let's say. But, but uh, maybe it's, it is easier to approximate uh, the linear model. The linear model, let's say. You take H. Yeah. You approximate it, you have H hat. This yeah. is another function, non, non, non convex. So oh, the okay. question so is still there. It so is still hard. Okay. It? Okay. 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 So you spent uh, this kind of uh, computational complexity to find a chat. But now, how can you, the goal here is to obtain an algorithm that does optimization with the same computational complexity. It's not unbounded, so this is the point. I don't know if it is, uh, if it is clear to everybody. Okay, so we need something more. And as we said, uh, uh, we, there is this beautiful uh, uh, equivalence between the, those two problems. So let's, let's try to use uh, results from approximation theory. Okay. And to do so, the first thing we do is that we transform this dense set of inequalities into a dense set of equalities. Okay. So we add, uh, this just, uh, we are just rewriting the problem. So nothing changes. We, are, we add uh, a function f that is non, so we transform the, h of x minus c non-negative, larger than zero, we just write it explicitly, so equal to f where f is non-negative, okay? But look that again here, immediately we gain something because f is defined as h minus c, so not only f is non-negative, but it also m times differentiable because h is m times differentiable. So we gain for free that f is non-negative, but also m times differentiable, okay? And so now we can use the results from approximation theory. That is, uh, uh, so this is uh, still from the book of Wendland, if you want a reference. It is a very classical result. It tells you that now you define the function u that is h minus c minus f, okay? This uh, in your dreams must be equal to zero everywhere, this function u. You know that this function u is uh, uh, m times differentiable because it's the difference between h and c and f, okay? And uh, so this result tells you that if you control u, if you uh, impose that u is zero in a set of points that are well distributed, let's say on a grid or, or on a covering of your, of your space, then, you in the old space, in the old set that you are covering, cannot be larger than epsilon. If you choose a number of points that is in the order of epsilon minus d over m times the norm of u. Why? Because u has a rigidity, is m times differentiable. So if you fix it to zero in enough point, it cannot behave wildly outside. Okay, so this is the, if you want, the, the idea behind. We are going to prove a, a, a so we can prove it uh, like um, in the general setting, but I guess that for simplicity, we could just do it uh, uh, in a subcase if, it, if, we, if we take the point on the grid to see the, this kind of result. So maybe either later or tomorrow we, we can prove uh, a subcase of this. Uh, of this uh, of this theorem, but it is very powerful because now you see that uh, if you allow to pay epsilon in error, you can uh, substitute uh, this uh, dense set of equalities uh, with just uh, the equalities over the points xi that I selected. Okay, 
So let's do this. Now we fix h minus c equal to f, so h minus c minus f equal zero in the, uh, in the discrete set of points, finite set of points that I have selected. You see here that uh, this number depends also on the norm of u. So you have to control this norm. If you let it go to infinity, uh, it does not help you, this, uh, this discretization. And so this is why we regularize with the norm of f, because the norm of u is uh, the norm of h, the norm of h minus c, you can bound it as the norm of h minus c plus the norm of f. So you need to control the norm of f. And so you know that this problem now, you can prove easily that this problem, and we will do it, um, as error uh, epsilon is e epsilon far if you choose properly lambda from the uh, the global optim the the solution of the original problem. But now you see that we express the non uh, convex optimization problem as a convex optimization problem. Okay, a, con a concave maximization problem. It is the same uh, over the set of non-negative functions. Okay, so now we have to optimize it. And possibly we need a, a model for negative functions that preserves the convexity of the problem and for which the representation that we choose is the property of consensus approximation. And so this is where we will use the PSD models that we've seen before. Okay. Uh, one simple way to go from here so what we do is that instead of f, we put f of underscore a for a matrix a big enough, okay? And so what we'll obtain is a problem of this form. So one way, if, if, you, if you are familiar with the, I don't know, did you do representer theorem with, uh, with Lorenzo or uh, with, uh, with Silvia, I don't know, with someone? Yeah, yeah both with Saverio and uh, Ernesto. Okay, perfect. So, so in the abstract and in the concrete way. Okay, so uh, a fancy way to do this is actually that you put uh, here a linear operator over like a linear uh, uh, positive operator over the uh, Hilbert space that you like. I don't know, the Hilbert space of uh, uh, Sobole functions that are m times differentiable. And then you let the um, represent is what we will do uh, uh, the next class, uh, we will let the representer theorem to give you the final dimensional form. That is the form that we have seen uh, before. So linear combination of A, I, J, G, next I, G, next J. Uh, or you can choose a basis a priori and you use the approximation theorems. Uh, so the final problem you obtain is of this form. You see, so the... the um, so if you put, if you plug the model inside, the, the um, constraints remain linear because uh, A enters linearly in, the, in F. And here you can bound, uh, you can find uh, an upper bound of the norm of F with the trace of A. And so now this problem is uh, um, a, a classical SDP problem. You are bounding the trace of A under linear constraints. So you can use uh, standard uh, SDP uh, algorithms to solve it. In particular, um, so I don't know if you are familiar with SDPs, but the, this kind of constraint are called low rank. So you can, so in general, SDPs are, are expensive. You can solve, this one is a, a simple SDP problem. You can solve with dumped Newton method with the, with the cost that is in the order of N to power 3.5. Okay, so let's put all together. Do we achieve the global minimum? And we obtain, we will obtain indeed in our classes, a result like this. So if our function is regular and times differentiable and as the global minima that satisfy the conditions we have seen before. So either they are isolated with strict Hessian or the, uh, the zeros are a manifold with strict tension in the orthogonal direction. Then with the number of points in the order, so I presented everything for m times differentiable functions, but actually our proofs for simplicity will be done in Sobolev spaces, okay? 
where in the Sobolev space, the optimal rate is this one without the minus two. So if N is the optimal rate is uh, corresponds to the uh, optimal rate for Sobolev spaces, here we pay a minus two because of the technicality of the proofs that we will see. So this is, if you want, uh, this minus two is, is not optimal. Then we will obtain a, an approximation of the global optimum up to error epsilon, okay? So this shows that uh, the algorithm that we presented in the previous slides achieves the global optimum, the global minimum of H. If you choose a number of points, it is in the order of epsilon minus D divided M minus D over two, okay? And this is optimal. So this rate is almost optimal for, uh, for uh, Sobolev uh, spaces. But in general, the interesting thing, so this N, we have seen the computational complexity is N to power 3.5. So the whole procedure will cost you in time, epsilon minus 3.5 times the number we've seen before. Okay, so. What bothers us is the exponent 3.5, okay? But still you see that you have an algorithm that is re that um, uh, is adaptive to the regularity of your functions, okay? So if your function is very regular, let's say m times differentiable with m very big, way larger than d, or even, uh, um, well, we, did, we didn't cover here, but even analytic or C infinity, you will have that this rate will behave accordingly. In particular, if your function is infinity, this one will become logarithm one over epsilon to power d. Okay, so it will be logarithmic in epsilon. And in particular, you see that if m is larger than 2d, you escape the curse of dimensionality. So your algorithm will cost you epsilon minus three to find the global optimum. And uh, of course, you will pay the same constants we have seen before. So like d, d factorial, because it's the same that we have. But you know already that you cannot escape this uh, because otherwise you, you could embed uh, inside a, 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 a smooth a regular function, your NP, NP hard problem uh, that you like most and you could solve it uh, in epsilon minus three. So this, uh, there is at least a constant in the order of two to the D that uh, it seems difficult uh, to remove unless you really restrict your function and you can guarantee and you guarantee that in your function, in your set of functions, you have only uh, problems that can be solved in polynomial time. Okay. But this is, uh, I mean, this would be really interesting to explore, but uh, um, so requires a regularity condition that is, uh, uh, way more subtle than just uh, the number of times you can differentiate a function. Okay. Uh, Sorry, may I ask? Uh, yes. So, but this uh, is, so this algorithm is adaptive to the regularity or adaptive means that you have to know a priori the regularity and you... No, no, no it's adaptive. So it's really, um, you put a function inside and uh, in a sense it, it, it uh, perceives the regularity and adapts to it. Okay, so you choose the kernel. Uh... So you can choose, uh, uh, you can choose, for example, you can choose the Gaussian kernel. Okay. Okay. So you lose a logarithmic factor, mm -hmm. but then automatic. So either you know the regularity a priori, you choose the Sobolev kernel of regularity M. Okay. And that's it, something you can do. Or it's a uh, it's more advanced version of the same result. You choose uh, a kernel that is uh, smoother and possibly like a infinity or uh, analytic like the Gaussian kernel. And uh, you pay a logarithmic term and automatically it will, uh, it will stop at the right M, let's say. That is an approximation from inside. Yeah, just a philosophical mm -hmm. question, if I may. So uh, it seems, it, it, it seems uh, you are doing uh, the same thing that you did uh, before. You know, just saying, uh, okay, it passes just uh, uh, in these points. Mm -hmm. So where it is that you are gaining because you are interpolating F on all the points and that yes, you use exactly. the, or uh, is the positivity important? It's not clear to me. 
So the fact is that, uh, so the, the goal, the, the, the idea here is that you pass from a dense set of inequalities to a dense set of equalities. Equalities are way more restrictive for the, for the, uh, um, so you're, you're, they are giving you way more information because inequality you're saying, okay, you must be above, but then you can do whatever, okay? Here instead, uh, you're really controlling the, uh, the function. And since uh, we are in the setting where the function is rigid, well, you are giving way more information because you are, uh, if you want, you are leveraging the rigidity of the problem. The, the positivity you needed just uh, for the question that Andrea was saying. So in order to estimate just, okay, I take C and that's it. Uh, the minimum of F is C. Yes, yes. F takes into account the fact that you are only interested. So if you want, with respect to approximation, you are only interested to one side of uh, the approximation. Yeah, yeah. No? Mm -hmm. And so F takes, takes exactly into account this. Uh... Yeah, okay, okay. And the other question is less philosophical, more uh, algorithmic if you want. So... Is there a way also to to choose? Uh, so the points uh, you choose all the points a priori, or you could do an information. Uh, so uh, so you gain an adaptive uh, way to choose. Uh, that's a very good question. Like bandit or something. It's a very good question. So, um, so the optimal rate of approximation uh, are quite interesting because they tell you. Uh, that uh, does not matter how do you choose points. You can choose them uh, a priori in a smart way, like in a grid. So like, like there should be a kind of covering of your space, okay? If you do this, they are enough. In the worst case, you don't gain anything if you do adaptive procedures, okay? So for any adaptive procedure, there is a counter example in a space of function rich enough that... Uh, for which uh, you could have done better by choosing them a priori. So uh, then, of course, the, the reality is different because maybe the functions we really want. Uh, but this is for approximation. This is approximation. Okay. But then you, you so we, here we just used approximation, uh, a result okay. from approximation theory. So we inherit this, uh, this uh, to obtain optimal rates, we inherit this, uh, um, let's okay, say, okay, okay. Uh, that is fact that we, we don't gain it. anything okay. uh, doing it. Yeah, adaptive. because I was wondering if precisely this difference. So we are approximating, you want to cover the, your information, yes. but maybe if you know that uh, f of zero is zero and f of, I don't know, two is 1,000, uh, your function yeah, you is would, something you, yeah. Lipschitz uh, and you are minimizing, you don't care about information yes. around two, so if there was a way, I know, to exploit these yes. or, uh, I don't know. No, okay, okay so thanks. For the, this said uh, for, for, the, for the optimal rates. So if you put the head of the theoretician, say I could, but I wouldn't gain anything. So I, I saved some, uh, some paper, but I mean, from a practical viewpoint, it can make the difference. You can gain constants. So the rate is the same, but you can gain constants. And in practice, if you are, 1,000 times faster, maybe uh, it's interesting. And so definitely you can use it as uh, um, uh, a, a building block of a um, uh, Bayesian optimization method. That is exactly what you say. So you start with a bunch of points, then you select the best point that at the same time, uh, um, so it's the best in a trade-off between uh, uh, exploration of the space and the exploitation of the global minimum. And uh, so they, this is something we could do. We didn't explore this yet uh, because we have more ideas than students still. I mean, if we have a lot of students and, uh, but uh, that, that could be a very interesting uh, direction uh, to, to explore. Also because maybe you don't want to compute again the result. If you add one point, you don't want to compute again the result. You want just to do like a smart update of the procedure. Okay, so we have seen, so thanks for the question because we have, we, we have let's say, uh, highlighted the fact that the important thing is passing from a dense set of inequalities to a dense set of equalities. And 
actually, so we built, uh, we transformed the uh, non-convex optimization problem up to uh, the point where we've wrote it in terms of a dense set of inequalities. But if you see, um, uh, applied the mathematics, there are many interesting problems where you are trying to optimize some functions subject to a dense set of inequalities. Okay, and here I do. Okay, so maybe we can do this later. So here I do a list of problems. Okay, let's take, so we talked about non-convex optimization, but uh, we have probability representation and uh, the fact that you have the, fa the function must be non-negative everywhere, or uh, you want to represent your function in, with conic constraints. You have optimal transport. You, so we will see this, but imagine, uh, so you have, uh, you want to compute the vastest time distance between two densities, okay? And uh, uh, if you take the dual, your function is an optimization over two potentials under the constraints that everywhere, if the potentials are called U and V, U of X plus V of Y must be smaller than the cost C of X, Y. And this is a dense set of inequalities. So this is a setting where you could use the same technique to obtain fast algorithms that uh, escape the curse of dimensionality in the rate. Okay? And this is indeed what we explored with uh, our postdoc, uh, Boris. Uh, and so if you want, and so in general, the idea is that you do the same steps. You, print, you take your problem with dense set of inequalities you transform the dense set of inequalities into a dense set of equalities, adding uh, the non-negative function f, and then you discretize. And finally, you substitute the function f with the PSD model. At this point, you obtain uh, the problem under the same functional with uh, a, a finite number of equalities constraints over the PSD matrices, okay? And uh, this is the same recipe that we explored in all those problems. And uh, we wrote uh, the details in this last paper that went out uh, a couple of days ago. Um, so what to say? So this is uh, a connection with uh, actually a field that now is uh, at most 30 years, uh, uh, explored by algebrists, so people working on, uh, on, uh, on polynomials. It was started by... Uh, Nesterov with univariate trigonometric polynomials and uh, with multivariate polynomials by Lasser. And so the idea was this one. So if, if I have a function that is uh, a polynomial, maybe I can match, so I can do a similar construction where I go, I'm going to match the, um, uh, our poly, uh, the polynomial of interest in terms of sum of squares of polynomials. So this is called uh, sum of squares. And uh, so what we gain, so what we brought here with respect to this theory is that uh, it's like when you go from uh, Zariski topology to, uh, so you, when you add more functions, so you obtain a topology where uh, you can do more things. So here we imported uh, uh, functional analytics tools. We have uh, norms. We can quantify explicitly convergence rates while all the results obtained on polynomials are on the dimensions of the ideals, so are very rough measures of the difficulty of the problem and also very abstract constructions. So if you, you will see the proofs are, uh, uh, the next days are, uh, I mean, we can do in a master course. They are not uh, uh, particularly uh, abstruse. And uh, using those techniques, you can also, so those uh, functional analytic techniques, you can also uh, obtain actually very precise results for polynomials themselves. And so we proved, uh, so they obtained the rate for this kind of algorithm that was uh, epsilon minus d over two. We showed that uh, under suitable condition, you can still obtain a, a term, a rate that is the same rate for analytic functions. That is uh, logarithm of one over epsilon to the d. Also from a theoretical viewpoint, it really simplifies the analysis. And where is the curse of the dimensionality in the end? It's always in the constant. So 
sorry. Uh, the, the course of dimensionality in the last, um, in the green uh, circle, in the green uh, rate that you have circled. Well, is you in go the, from the epsilon minus d over two to the logarithm. Yeah, so no, no, there is no course of dimensionality. Indeed. Well, okay. <laughs> you pay d here, so. Yeah, but it's a logarithm. It's, it's not, in the logarithm. Yeah, not uh, so yes. bad, let's say. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's, uh, but it's the same that you obtain here. For example, if you let M uh, uh, go, uh, go to infinity, you know, if you let M go to infinity, you obtain exactly this, uh, this rate. Okay, thank you. Still, uh, so you have always, so it's important, you have always the constant in front that are the same, like the factorial. And, uh, and uh, these are the data and constant and uh, can never be cut. So the best estimate that we have for this constant is two to power d minus one, something okay. like this. Uh, but, uh, it could be that this constant is polynomial in some way. Or... No, so in general, no, okay. unless uh, p is equal to mp, so yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't go in that direction. But something that you can do, and uh, this would be a very interesting direction to explore for a PhD student <laughs> like you are of me, and. Uh, um so we could we could describe a new family of functions that is maybe larger than convex functions so as, as a, a smaller subclass of non-convex functions that may be contain convex but such that we are sure that inside there are only polynomial pro you can encode only polynomial problems there and so there i expect so this is a necessary condition to me to have a, uh, an approximation rate that with the polynomial constants. This would be an interesting direction to explore. Yeah. You have suggestions? Oh, that's yeah. interesting. Okay, so, well, that's it. I guess also we are, we finished the, for, uh, yes. A good time. Okay, so we can so we can close here. I'm uh, open to questions, and uh, uh, so few few things to explore. So guarantees a posteriori how to obtain certain. So this is so we talked about non convex optimizations. Typically, when you do optimization, at least in the convex case, you like to have certificates. So to say, okay, I have this number. How far am I from the global optimum? Can I have? Uh, can I quantify it explicitly? And uh, there are nice ways to obtain guarantees a, a, a posteriori. This is something we explored more recently with uh, with some students. And maybe we can do we can derive it. Uh, well, I would say the last class if we have time. And uh, the, the other direction that we, uh, we didn't explore this too much instead is uh, can we obtain algorithms that are faster. So we have this uh, factor 3.5 in the exponent. Can we reduce it uh, or it is un unavoidable, okay? So we will have, uh, let's say, d over m times 3.5. Can we have uh, d over m times two, times 1.5, I don't know, times one? Okay. Well, the, that's it, I guess. So. It's my pleasure to introduce Filippo, who make my life very hard of not writing anything on the blackboard, but it's the continuation of uh, the machine learning for quantum physics. And he's going to talk about automatic differentiation, near ODs, and a lot more. Thank you, Filippo. I don't know if a lot more. Does this work? Yes. No? Yeah. OK. Um, OK. So this is a, a continuation of the first lecture of Giuseppe, because uh, it was only here yesterday, so we couldn't uh, have actually a progression. Um, I would like to give you a slightly different uh, introduction to automatic differentiation because I I think, at least from the title of the contributed talks this afternoon, I see that many of you are already doing machine learning, so there is no need uh, for you to know how to compute uh, gradients uh, because I guess uh, if you're doing, uh, if you're optimizing neural network, you're doing that already. But I would, I would like to give you a bit more formal uh, background on on how automatic differentiation works uh, and uh, especially what is its performance model so why it's low sometimes and what you can do to improve it and uh, 
and also what can be some improvements to automatic differentiation in the next few years. Um, yeah, I will get to that. Okay, so. So how many of you, I'm curious, uh, uh, please raise your hand. How many of you have ever heard of differentiable programming? Okay, not many. Um, so automatic differentiation is a tool maybe uh, within the realm of uh, what, what some people recently started calling differentiable programming, which is the idea that if you have some some code, an algorithm, Okay, an algorithm is nothing over than, than a function that takes an input from some from 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 a space and gives you an output. Okay, so the idea is that if you have this, if you have some code that computes uh, that computes the output, you can also compute the gradient of this function. And and sometimes your algorithm is is very complicated. Like there are for loops. Uh, you are doing, you are using search or sort algorithm. And so it might not be very simple or uh, it might not be immediate evident how to compute the gradient for it. In Within the picture of differentiable programming, however, we can split the, the whole function into many small pieces. And, uh, and if we are able to define uh, elementary functions and the gradient or, or some over, some other object for every elementary function, then by composing all of them together, we are able to compute gradients of essentially arbitrary code. And, and this is very useful because uh, then you can literally optimize anything, uh, any algorithm you can write. Okay. So um, I would like to start with a very, uh, by writing a very trivial thing. Um, so, Let's assume we have a function that is uh, that takes a real input and gives me a real output. Then the, de the definition of a derivative, right, is simply the limit, at least uh, for me, uh, for delta going to zero of x plus delta minus f of x divided by delta. I mean, maybe there are better definitions, uh, but I will take this one, right? Okay, so. How do we compute this in practice or on a, on a computer, right? Um, one way, again, very brutal, is to to take the first term in the Taylor expansion and so approximate this as a finite difference of f of x plus delta minus f of x divided by delta. And uh, you can very easily show that uh, essentially you are neglecting terms uh, uh, of order delta square. I hope you all agree with me on that. Now that means that if I have a, if I have a black box function uh, coded in my computer or uh, in your Python, whatever you want, um, a way to compute the, the gradient would be to to query the function for x plus delta and then for f of x, and then compute the difference. Now, what delta should you pick, right? Like, I'm a physicist, I want to put numbers, I want to execute my code. Uh, I, I, I don't particularly care about uh, this formula itself. I care about uh, running this formula. So we can simply do this plot, right? We take delta, uh, the error of my approximation, and this is going up quadratically, yes? Why is the error not O of delta, not delta squared? Sorry? Why is the error not order delta instead of delta squared? Uh, I guess it's just the notation of what he, he means by O. Yes, for me, it's uh, terms you're in a big O notation, not terms that you're uh, neglecting. Yeah, but shouldn't, shouldn't the error be O of delta still? Sorry? Sorry, yes, you're right. Indeed. Okay. So, 
So what this is suggesting is that you should pick a delta that is as small as possible. Okay. So now I would have liked to show it to you on the computer, but I can't because I would have to hide the, the blackboard. So you will have to trust me. But if you if you do this for any function, for example, a sine of x or cosine or whatever else, you will not see this kind of plot, but you would see something that looks more like this. Do you know why? Yes, exactly. So the point is that we are putting together x, so the, the, the input to the function, and delta, so this uh, small sensitivity, so this small change. Essentially, if x is something like 1.012345, if I take a delta that is very small, like 0 0.0000100, well, no, let's do like one here. The fact that I have a limited number of bits of precision in the way I store my floating point numbers on a computer means that I'm effectively truncating this one. And and therefore, uh, this delta is, is essentially zero when I add it to x. And this is why the error for very small delta diverges. And then uh, for small enough delta, this is still a problem. Now, this means that using finite differences is very complicated in practice because uh, depending on the function that you're considering, depending on the x, uh, uh, the point where you are evaluating this function, uh, this curve will change. And therefore, you would have to find uh, the optimal value of delta every time you change something in, in, in your function, the parameters, uh, etc. So while this is a useful algorithm, this is not ideal. We would like something that is uh, automatic in the sense that we don't have to tune uh, hyperparameters, delta in this case, every time we want to compute a derivative. So if you notice, the problem here is that I'm adding together x and delta. So those two objects that represent, in principle, two different things. One is representing the, the point in the domain where I want to evaluate my function. And the other one is, uh, in mathematical terms, an element of a tangent space uh, of my domain at x. So a very simple idea to, to a very simple thing that I can do is to not combine those two objects onto the, onto the same space, onto the same real axis, but instead work in a vector space with two components and keep the two information separated, okay? And the most simple way, and this is, a, I think, a neat trick, is to simply use complex numbers. So instead of perturbing f along the real axis, I can perturb it along the imaginary axis. So I take a, a purely imaginary perturbation, i delta. OK? So if you do that, um, assuming uh, this only works if f, if f is a holomorphic function, um, if x is real, then f of x will still be real. Think about a sine or a cosine, for example. Then f of x plus i delta will be complex. And you can show that this is exactly the imaginary part of f of x plus i delta divided by delta plus order of delta again. OK? Now. This is exactly the same formula as before, but I'm no longer adding x and delta together. I'm, I'm storing them as two different numbers. It's a complex number. So I'm, I'm storing two different uh, values. One is the real part, and the other is the imaginary part. And therefore, if I, was to, if I were to plot this, uh, this, the error committing by, by computing the derivative using this trick, you would find something that looks more like this. So essentially here, so below numerical precision, you will have essentially zero error, or you're not able to, uh, to compute the exact error because you're below numerical precision, and then it starts to go up. So one, one useful way to compute derivatives for uh, an arbitrary holomorphic function is always just feed it a small perturbation, as small as you want, uh, along the imaginary axis, and you will get for free the derivative. So this approach. Um, 
was used extensively in the at the beginning of uh, the history of computational physics. Um, I, I I told you forty years ago before uh, researchers really looked into automatic differentiation because it was a very cheap, simple trick. But it can be formalized. It can be generalized to non-holomorphic functions. It can be generalized uh, to compute higher order derivatives. And uh, there is a lot of theory about it, which I think it's uh, very beautiful. And uh, in particular, the technique is known as dual number representation. So in the case of imaginary, when you add an imaginary small number, you should, isn't it the case where you have a delta square instead there? Probably you because, get a uh, higher you, order, yes. Yes, yeah, so if you just do real, you have delta. If you do adding an imaginary number, you obtain delta square because you are de eliminating the real part where you would have the delta error. Yes, because you're directly computing the derivative there. So the, the way yeah. you can prove it is you simply tailor expand this function uh, you, you will see around the... delta and it would be exact. So you, you would really have a delta square, I think. Exactly. So the dual number representation is a, is a let's say, technique that comes from um, a field of uh, numerical analysis known as the smooth infinitesimal analysis. And... Uh, it's essentially a, a, a way to better formalize this approach. Um, I will just give you a brief idea of how this works. Essentially, instead of using imaginary numbers, right, where uh, essentially we have the imaginary unit defined such that i square is zero, I, will, uh, I want to define a, an abstract number. I will call it epsilon. It has the same uh, role as the imaginary unit, but now Sorry, this is one. I spoiled myself. Yes. I have uh, epsilon square to be defined to be zero. The idea for that is uh, that I essentially want to compute uh, linear derivatives, the first order in the derivatives. Now, if I do this, uh, we, can, uh, we can define a bunch of, uh, uh, we can take a bunch of uh, fundamental properties, right? So. I want uh, the resulting uh, number in this, uh, let's say, complex space or uh, dual space to to essentially behave like uh, like a complex number. So I would have I don't know uh, x plus epsilon x bar. So this would be the the dual part plus y plus epsilon y bar, and this will be x plus epsilon plus epsilon x plus y plus epsilon x bar plus y bar. OK, like this is very simple. Now, if I multiply two numbers together instead, you will get that the, that the standard part is x, y, of course. Then you have a dual part, which will be x bar plus y bar. And then you get a term where you have epsilon square, which by definition is 0. And if you think about it, this is exactly how you would propagate derivatives. Um, we can, we can, for example, compute the derivative of, I don't know, something like the, the cosine. Okay, so cosine of x plus epsilon x bar. Okay, this is just so yeah, that I, this works. So uh, I yes. think it's so. So it's epsilon, and then uh, x bar y plus. Uh x uh, y bar yes uh, y x sorry so if you take the cosine of x plus epsilon x bar um, if you tailor expand these uh, you get sum of n equal zero um, x plus epsilon x bar to n plus one divided by two n plus one factorial. And now I want to unravel this, uh, this term here. So I will still have sum over n of two n plus one factorial of x to the two n plus one. 
plus, I will take the first term, so 2n plus 1, x to the 2n, epsilon x bar, divided by 2n plus 1 factorial, plus epsilon square, etc. And this is all zero. And now it should be easy to see that this is exactly, this is the cosine of x. And this is epsilon x bar, the sine of x. Yes. Okay. So in general, yes. I guess they are inverted, so. Sorry? This is the expression for the sinus and the, because it's it's odd. Cosine, yes. So, but, I find it yeah. Hmm? No, sorry. Yeah, no, 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 the expression at the beginning is not. Yeah, the, this is the cosine, uh, this is uh, the sine. Time. Yes. And maybe there is also minus one to the n or something like that. Uh, yes. Which then I would do? Yeah, it's it's minus one to the n, but it, 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 so it's something that then carries over power n. Yeah. Yes. Uh, maybe and yeah, 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 and, and. Uh, yeah. So here as well. And here it will uh, be absorbed, so it's fine. Yes. Yes. And then this is sine of x plus epsilon x bar cosine of x. So, yes. So, yes. Okay. So, in general, what I'm trying to say is that if you have a function f of x plus epsilon x bar, you can prove that essentially you are computing f of x plus epsilon the f of x times x bar, okay? So to fast forward a bit, um, what, what we actually have to work with in uh, machine learning when we work with uh, neural networks, all this kind of function is uh, functions that are defined not on, on on scalar values, but on vector spaces. And and therefore, um, for, for a function f now defined, uh, let's say, from Rn to Rm, this uh, description is still valid, but now the ith component of a function f will Will be will be computed by taking f i the x j x j and here you have a sum over j okay so essentially I mean it's very easy to see that this is the Jacobian right it's the Jacobian of f evaluated at x which is multiplying this x bar. So a bit more formally, what is going what is going on here is that if I have my function f that goes from from x to some f of x in in, a, in another space, you know better than me that the Jacobian of f of, at x is a function that takes um, elements of my tangent space in x and associates elements in the tangent space of f of x, right? And so I can, like the notation I will be using is that I will take an x bar uh, from this space and I will be computing f bar, which is the Jacobian of f of x times x bar, yes. Okay, so this is really a push forward. I'm taking an element of a vector space of this vector space. I'm looking in a sense, I'm looking at how a small perturbation in my input space transforms uh, 
how much it returns the output of my of my function. Okay. Good. I would like to underline the fact that um, x bar is so that if I want to fully reconstruct the Jacobian, so the matrix of the Jacobian, if I don't, if I in principle don't have access to it, I can simply right multiply the Jacobian with all the basis elements, right? So imagine that I have a black box that can only compute the push forward, so can only apply the Jacobian to, to an input vector, but I don't have access to the Jacobian itself. Then to reconstruct the full Jacobian, I can still I can simply compute Jacobian of f of x times epsilon zero, which would be a vector like with a one in the first entry and then all zeros. Then I could compute j of f of x of epsilon one, which is a vector with a zero in the second component, and so on and so forth. So if you have a black box that implements the push forward operation, you can always extract the Jacobian by simply multiplying repeatedly by every basis element of a tangent space in, of your input. Okay. Now, what happens in machine learning, again, is that you are composing many different functions, right? So you will have a big F, which is uh, F composed with G composed with delta. And let's say, for example, but this is a fun that big F is a function that goes from Rn to R. Okay? So this is, for example, really like uh, this will be the loss function of uh, that, that you will be trying to train. And inside of it, you have some pooling operations, some, some neural network layers, and a lot of other things. So, Essentially, what you can do is you can apply repeatedly the chain rule to compute the gradient, right? But but a bit more formally, what is going on is that, that the gradient of f the ith component of the gradient of f is nothing over than the Jacobians of every one of those functions repeatedly applied one after each other. Does it make sense? Essentially, what I'm saying is that I'm applying the Jacobian of f on, uh, let's say I'm taking value x and I'm mapping it to f of x. Sorry. Big f of x, which is equal to f of g of gamma of x. Then the gradient will be the Jacobian of f at g of gamma of x applied to the Jacobian of G at gamma of X, applied to the Jacobian of gamma in X times X I. Yes. Does it make sense? Okay, so essentially you see the way I, if I only have a black box that does the push forward, um, the first thing I will be doing is I will be doing the push forward of this uh, Xi of the sensitivity in my input space. And uh, if I want to compute the various elements in my, in my gradient, essentially what I will have to do is I will have to take Xi to be one of those uh, basis elements. So 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, et cetera, et cetera. I compute this object, this will give me gamma bar, okay, which is a new element in the tangent space of gamma. Or sorry, of uh, of the output of uh, of the output of gamma. And then I compute the Jacobian vector product or the push forward of this object and I get uh let's call G bar and I do this repeatedly until I finally get my result. Now you will see that since the, the gradient with respect to the various parameters, it's a, it's a vector, right? Um, 
to compute all the entries in my gradient, I will have to repeat this procedure n times, right? Once for every basis element of my input of my domain tangent space. So this is not ideal because I have to redo my calculation n times, okay? This is essentially forward mode differentiation, okay? It's the chain rule, it's the chain rule applied in such a way that you get repeated Jacobian vector products, okay? So you're right multiplying the Jacobian by a vector. And the way you can compute those Jacobian vector products is by using dual numbers. And this is how most uh, automatic differentiation libraries do it. Uh, okay. I was basically about to, to ask this. So numerically, like, for example, when I have use a module inside my, my, let's assume, TensorFlow, for example, which uses automatic differentiation, like, under the hood, what's happening? Like, is it already knew the Jacobian for this module? Or, like, does it, only, I mean, what does that happen? Like, does he compute the Jacobian so, or does he know it? Yeah, it depends a bit on what you're using. TensorFlow is doing uh, very old things, so I would avoid talking about it because it's uh, mm -hmm. doing some overly complicated thing. Um, PyTorch and Jax, for example, um, will have a function which is called the uh, value and JVP, mm -hmm. which it's a, it's a black box that takes, a, if you want, value and uh, JVP, it's a function that will take as input, um, let's say if you if this is, mm, how to say, but let's say you have, you have a function f defined from r n to r rm, okay? Mm -hmm. This can be a sine, a cosine, okay? So if, um, if whatever auto diff framework you're using uh, ha has this function stored in, in a database, then it will look up the, this rule, the value and grad function, value and uh, JVP product function. And this uh, essentially will take as input the value, so Rn, and uh, a vector in the, in the tangent space. Okay, so those two elements, and uh, will give you as output the tuple Rm and T uh, F of X Rm. Okay, so this has been implemented by someone mm -hmm. for sine, for cosine, for addition, for subtraction, for multiplication, for the eigen decomposition, for the QR decomposition. Mm -hmm. Someone implemented by hand uh, this function, okay, which takes an input value, the the vector, mm -hmm. or, or tangent vector, and compute and, and pushes both of them forward. Okay. okay, and then like the composition is just the multiplication of the Jacobians. Exactly. Okay, so that and chain that rule essentially okay. chain rule. Okay. Yes. Okay, makes sense. Now there are other frameworks like some stuff in Julia, some experimental things in JAX, that use dual numbers. So if it's not stored somewhere, they, they compute it using dual numbers, where you define the algebra of dual numbers and then they, they compute the stuff. Okay, yes? Uh, sorry, but uh, so this algorithm works for uh, functions that uh, are known, for example, sine, cosine, or uh, does it work for a strange function defined in some strange way? Like? Uh, a function... Uh, uh, yeah? So a function uh, that is not analytic, let's say. Yes, so the the, the point is this. As long as you, when you implement a function, you're using other functions, right? Yeah. As long as you use other functions that your automatic differentiation engine knows about, then all is... Yeah, but if I don't use a function that it's in the library, uh, no, so I, I don't I, know. I will, rephrase, I will rephrase my answer. A computer can execute a limited number of operations, right? Okay. On its registers. Yeah. If you define this uh, value and JVP for every one of the approximately 100 uh, 
uh, elementary assembly operations that, uh, that the processor can execute. In principle, you can compute the gradients by applying the chain rule of anything. Okay. Anything that you can write. What? Of anything that you can write. Of anything that you can right. write in code. Yeah. Now, this is to do this, it's very hard. So th there is only one implementation of this. Uh, it's called uh, Enzyme, done at MIT, um, which literally does this on assembly language. Um, but, but yeah, in general, the problem is that the automatic differentiation, uh, applying the chain rule repeatedly might not yield the correct uh, derivative. I will give you an example. So, yeah. let, let, let me just yeah, yeah, yeah. the answer. So if you are computing the sign on, on a computer, you are not really computing the sign. You are probably using some lookup table and uh, polynomial approximation up to order uh, seven, okay? So th that sum is not infinite. And now if you apply the chain rule to it, uh, what you will get is something that looks like the cosine, but with one less order, right? Because you are, you are eliminating the first term and then you're going down. This means that automatic differentiation of sine would give you something that has lost one order. So if you take the fifth order derivative or sixth, essentially you would get a constant, okay? Which is why it is in general very important that when you define some function, if you're not computing it exactly, but you're doing some approximations, usually you want to define how the Jacobian should be computed as well. Yes, exactly. So maybe it is on in, in this direction. So actually many operations, you, uh, most of the operations you do in the code are non-smooth, like if then, no? how do you, well, no, you just compare something with something else and then you decide what to do. So this is a, this is a non, Pandora non smooth. box. But uh, you can think that the, the Jacobian of the Jacobian vector product of uh, any felt statement uh, can be evaluated. So the moment you evaluate the felt statement and you choose which branch to pick, then uh, everything is well defined, right? So so usually you don't care about it. So numerically, so imagine a theta function like an Avicide theta. So unless uh, you, you you consider exactly zero, the numerically exact zero, which uh, we would like to argue as a physicist, it's a it's a set of uh, like zero dimension that you will never hit. Then uh, everything we do is well defined. More in practice, uh, what uh, what what we do numerically or in those implementations is that we always we we always choose uh, to define the derivative on one side. So we are not actually defining the derivative, but we are defining the right derivative. So. It's what I wrote maybe here. Imagine the heavy side theta. We usually we usually decide to define it only by by applying the the perturbation on the right side or on the left side, and then in this case uh, the the derivative is always well defined. But yeah, in general you don't care about uh, exact points. Um, you can what depending on the implementation, some implementation throw an error if you eat uh, that exactly that value or give you a none, not a number, but you can always define the, a, a well-behaving program. Okay, good. Yes. A function came up uh, in my mind. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, I have a function uh, that came up in my mind. For yes. example, if I have, uh, let's say, a continuous function and I'd integrate this function on the spheres, Okay. It's a function that, uh, let's say, I can uh, estimate uh, with uh, some methods, and I can uh, compute it just uh, on the point. So, in principle, just the first. Uh... So you're saying if you are if you have an integral. Yeah, let's say yeah yeah. And but... a function I find uh, via integrals, let's say. With the Monte Carlo integrals. Yeah, I can uh, compute the function just in the in the points. Okay, so then, it's a Pandora box. <laughs> You will have to define, so it's, uh, I would, maybe I can come to it later, but so you remember that yesterday Giuseppe said, uh, um, it's exactly what we do. 
uh, yesterday Giuseppe said uh, uh, we are trying to compute some fa some energy, right? Which is an expectation value of over x distributed according to a distribution of probability of a e log of x, right? So how do I compute the gradient of this? Well, sorry, let me add another thing. And, and then we approximate this with a sum of x taken from a set of samples of one over n samples e log of x, right? So if I compute the derivative of this code here, the derivative will be wrong because what I'm doing is that I have performed an approximation. So I will have to define the function expectation value, which is implemented like that, but whose Jacobian vector product I have to compute by hand. And it's not particularly hard. I mean, this is really like, you can define this in the continuous as uh, the x uh, psi x square e log of x, right? And so the derivative with respect to, let's say, theta here, just applying the chain rule a few times and uh, finding some over integrals. So you can do it. And we do it. So people in Bayesian um, methods, for example, use this, uh, the, those formulas a lot. OK? So in general, if you're when you're doing an approximation, you always have to think about the fact that you're doing it and so that your code does no longer coincide. So the automatic uh, gradient that you compute of your code with a chain rule does no longer match the gradient that you care about. OK? Yes? Because you somehow said the uh, finite difference is simple, but you got a delta, you got delta square. There is this hyperparameter. So let me do this super clean thing. And now we're starting to add Pandora boxes, right? So from a practical point of view, what are situations where I should choose? I mean, if I want to do a neural network, multiple layers, maybe a thousand, I have to do gradient descent, probably doing a bunch of finite differences is not a good idea. But I, might, I wonder, now we're talking about he's thinking about one function that has to come up with. So I wonder what is the rule of thumb where I should or not consider, for example, finite difference, which are remarkably simple. And I can just, you know, sure, I have to twiddle a delta, but if I'm a practical person, I could just spend some time on it and do it. I wonder if that's ever the case or is the answer is well, any, don't do it. Any just time, always do dual members automated differentiation. Yeah, that's a nice question. For example, anytime you have uh, in your function some uh, Monte Carlo integral, then uh, the gradient you would be computing by finite differences will most likely be wrong because uh, you would have to take care in now you, when you compute f of x plus delta and f of x you would have to take care for example to have exactly same samples otherwise uh, the, the gradient that you will be computing is not doesn't will be correct only on average then you would have to average it over many times moreover uh, another issue is that um Again, finite differences, uh, like forward differentiation, uh, they are very close, I mean, they're conceptually very similar, um, is very expensive uh, for functions that have uh, many, a very high dimensional domain, but a small co-domain. Because for every input parameter, you have to compute one different finite difference. So, it's a very viable approach uh, for functions with a do input space of up to, I don't know, 100 variables, for example. But then it starts to be rule of thumb. If there are no weird functions inside, as soon as you have weird functions inside, it's um, no longer very, it, it starts to become tricky. So what I wanted to say now is that um, this is forward mode differentiation. And I said this thing. Uh, that it's somewhat inefficient to compute the full gradient, which is what you need uh, in uh, in machine learning. So if you are already doing some machine learning, you know that in general what we care about is uh, back propagation or uh, backward uh, gradient or uh, a joint method. It, it comes under many names. But essentially the idea is that if my big F goes from Rn to R, instead of uh, taking uh, 
uh, basis vector in the tangent space of my domain and uh, pushing it forward, what I can do is I can do the pullback. So I can take, can define another operation. Uh, so if I define the Jacobian transpose, okay, of f of x, this is a function that takes values in uh, the tangent space of my codomain in f of x and maps them to the tangent space in Rn in x. And so in a sense, it takes sensitivities f bar and maps them to uh, x bar equal to Jacobian in f of x. No, uh, Jacobian of f, f of x, transpose of f bar. Does it make sense? So this is a pullback. And now, forward mode differentiation and backward mode differentiation ain't nothing over than using the push forward or the pullback, using the Jacobian or the Jacobian transpose. So to give a practical example, just to be understanding well, but so these f bar and x bar are different from, from yes. the others, are, yes. right? So it's not the inverse, but it's a transpose, so it's a joint uh, in some sense. So yeah, I'm, it's just notation. Usually I call f bar. As yeah, okay, okay, okay. What I'm pulling back. Mm -hmm. But indeed, it's not the inverse. Okay. Um, lambda now, yes. So if you want, the idea is that instead of computing uh, what the ith element of the gradient of f as the Jacobian of big F in x for x bar i. So the basis vector, we can simply take this to be a Jacobian transpose of f in f of x times this value that I take to be one. Yes. Um, I, I, just a, a curiosity because like the, the way I've always understood the, the idea of the transpose is uh, um, using the fact that if you propagate information in a, one direction you in a network then the information flows in the other direction with the transpose like do, does this thing make any sense or like or uh, like sh should I keep with this uh, sh should I keep having this kind of way of seeing things what or what does it mean for the information to flow backward and, and forward and backward? Like uh, I, I have in mind the differentiation in neural networks, like yes. uh, with forward uh, neural networks. So maybe let me just say one extra thing and so it might partially answer your okay. question okay. when you can ask okay. me the rest. Thank you. So, um, uh, did I? No, I deleted it. Great. Uh, okay, so for backward mode differentiation, again, we have this f that is the composition of f, g, gamma, right? Now, if I want to compute this, so the, the gradient of f using uh, the pullback, what I will be doing is I will be doing j of, let's start from here. Um, I will be starting with the last function f, because I start from the codomain, right? So j of f in f of g of gamma of x in, uh, let's say, 1, or let's call it f bar, which would be 1. OK. This is the first operation I have to do. So I pull back for f. Then I will have to pull back for g, g of gamma of x transpose and then I will pull back gamma 
okay? So, uh, and let me write it again. Instead, in forward mode differentiation, what we were doing was to uh, take um, J of F of F of uh, uh, G of gamma of X apply to G of G, J of G, no, sorry. Uh, ba, ba, ba. G of gamma x. Okay, so forward mode differentiation. The first thing I have to do is I compute gamma of x. Sorry, this is So the first thing I have to do is this uh, push forward, right? So I can compute gamma of x and the Jacobian in x times x bar. Instead, for backward mode differentiation, the first thing I have to do is to compute the Jacobian of f transpose at f of gamma of f of g of gamma of x and apply it to f bar. So you see, the first operation to compute the gradient in this case. Uh, requires knowledge of the output value. So where it's the output value, and I have to construct the tangent space around there. Exactly, but to get to the codomain, to get to the output manifold, I have to compute my full uh, function first. So this is where these uh, forward and then backward uh, passes come from. The fact that you first have to identify the output point you build the tangent space there, you consider the Jacobian transpose, and then you do the pullback. And you gradually go back all the time. And the last operation that you do, J of gamma, then you only need to know the output of the first one. So the, if you want this, uh, this structure of information flowing forward and backward, uh, I don't know if it really, I mean, I wouldn't say necessarily information, but yeah, in a sense, it's correct. But the point is that you need to know where every, output of every intermediate layer is. Does it make sense? What? No, no, but uh, yeah, so um, yes. Now, what is uh, what I wanted to get to is, uh, let me say one. Sorry, uh, the transport is on AJ or the argument or is the same? It's on the J. J, okay. on, on the J evaluated at that point. And the bar X, where is? Yeah. The bar X, X bar, is on uh, into the J of F uh, transport? So here is F. So the bar for me is simply notation. Okay. To, to mean that it's uh, it's one of, it's an element of the tangent space. Okay. Either of the input or of the output. I'm not being uh, super precise with the notation. So when I work with forward mode differentiation, for it's always that the it's always uh, a sensitivity to a tangent space in the input space, if you want. In this case, it's always uh, the tangent space of the out output space. Now the point is, uh, uh, if you see now, since the output space is a scalar of my capital F function, I can simply take the sense with uh, F bar to be one scalar, and I get the full Jacob, uh, the full gradient here. So with a single pass, with a single operation, with a single pullback, I'm getting the full gradient with respect to all the vari variables. So you see that computationally, the Jacobian and the Jacobian transpose have the same uh, complexity, but 
in backward mode differentiation, at least uh, for a Rn to R function, I only need uh, to do the differentiation once. Instead, uh, for forward mode, I need to do it n times. Is that clear? And this is, if you want, one explanation of why we always use backward mode differentiation in uh, uh, in machine learning, because we always have function that goes from R on Rn to R, and therefore the output space is color, is very low dimensional compared to the input space. And in that case, uh, using backward mode differentiation is always uh, a good idea. So now I will uh, throw at you a question. Um, so what if I want to go to higher order derivatives? So I have this uh, function f that goes from Rn to R. I can I can take uh, uh, the gradient of f to be a function that takes a, a value in Rn, so a point, and gives me and gives me an element of the tangent space in in the input space. Is that clear? So now, if I want to compute the, 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 the Hessian of my function, I would have to do, differentiate it again. But now this, uh, the gradient function is a function that goes from a n-dimensional space to an n-dimensional space. So the, so the, the principle that uh, would suggest me to do this with backward uh, mode differentiation doesn't apply anymore. And uh, I will not get into the details about it, but when the input and output space have the same dimensionality, it's always a good idea to use uh, forward mode. So in a sense, uh, when you want to go to higher order differentiation, you might need to use backward mode for the first, for the first derivative, but any following derivative uh, should always be computed with forward mode differentiation. There is never, ever, a good reason to use forward mode differentiation, sorry, backward mode differentiation for higher order derivatives. Okay? Good. Another, and finally, another thing that I wanted to mention, since uh, going to higher order derivatives uh, will require forward mode differentiation, there is actually a generalization of dual numbers that allow you to propagate the, the sensitivities up to a certain order. So instead of defining epsilon squared to be zero, for example, if you want to compute uh, also first and second order derivatives at the same time, you would just define epsilon cube to be zero. And then the algebra that, uh, that this defines would allow you to compute all higher order derivatives at the same time. Unfortunately, nobody has ever implemented uh, like in, a, in PyTorch, uh, JAX, or any other language, uh, this approach uh, known as Taylor mode uh, or dual uh, dual space uh, automatic differentiation. And therefore uh, we are uh, obliged to do forward over backward differentiation, which is somewhat inefficient. So uh, there are many tricky problems with doing this correctly, which is why nobody has done it yet in practice, or there are only some experiments that don't work very well in practice, but it's a direction that many engineers at Google, Facebook, and MIT and over Vector Institute are working on. So finding a better way to get access to higher order derivatives. Okay, so what time is it? You have more half an hour. Okay, so yes. Sorry, it's just something that is, is not so clear for me. Uh, like if you if you have your element in your tangent space in X, then you push it forward to the element to the tangent space of F of X, so the image. And and then so this is the Jacobian. And then the pullback will be the transpose of the Jacobian. Shouldn't it be that if you take the element here, you push it forward to F of X, and then you go back, you should recover X, but then you will be getting the uh, Jacobian transpose ja Jacobian of X, not yes. not X again. Uh, you see what I mean? Like you're not recording the element if you push it forward and then pull it back. Yes, because it's not the inverse. 
I mean, the Jacobian transpose is not the inverse of the Jacobian. No, no, exactly. But but that, that's why it's not clear because, for example, if you do it with differential forms and then you take the push forward will be, for example, Jacobian of, of, of the mapping. Ah, and you go back. And yeah. then you go back will be df minus t. Why, okay. why is it not here that case? Is, is it really a push forward and a pull back? That's a good question. I, I need to think about it. I think... Uh... I will get back to you. I need to think. Sure, more. sure. Thank you. But it, it is a push forward and a pullback. Um, I will get back to this question more. Okay, so I was hoping to do, be a bit faster. Um, so what, what I can do now is either show you a bunch of uh, practical examples of this in action and uh, what happens in practice, or I can briefly discuss uh, um, I wanted to discuss uh, neural differential equations, but uh, then there will surely be no time for practical examples. So is there any favorite? Show events. Yeah, who wants a practical example? And... Mm, I, I will be showing a bunch of how, imp what are the, that how the, the derivative is computed, uh, I mean, and how you get uh, higher order derivatives, how the Jacobian vector products, etc., can 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 be used. And I wanted to give an example of neural differential equation, but I guess there is no time. Okay, neural differential equations. Okay, so now it's a clean break. So this was a discussion about uh, neural differential uh, about uh, automatic differentiation. Um, now I want to discuss for a moment neural network architectures. Okay, so Giuseppe yesterday showed that uh, there are some, yeah, some neural network architectures, right, that are constructed by uh, concatenating uh, different uh, different functions. Right. So essentially, you have many layers, and which can be affine transformations, nonlinear transformations, uh, whatever comes to your mind, and, uh, and and this is a very simple example of a neural network. Now, in practice, what is happening is that um, we can say that the output of the layer uh, T. The so let's let's call the um, Let's call the state at uh, at time zero the input. Okay, so essentially, if I'm computing psi of x, uh, this will be phi d of h d. Okay, and you can do this recursively. So if h of zero is my input value, and then h of uh, uh, t plus one will be i of t, h of t, okay? So h of t, if you want, is uh, the value, h of zero is my input, then if I compute uh, phi zero, oops, zero, phi zero of h zero, this is this, the output uh, of my first layer, and then I do this recursively until I get to the end, right? So, in, so a bit graphically, I have here h zero, I apply phi phi zero, I get h one, I apply phi one until you get your output. Okay? Good. And these architectures have been used, uh, I mean they because phi can be convolutional neural networks, uh, they can be uh, pretty much anything you can think about. Okay. Now if we apply uh, backward mode differentiation. Okay, and we take 
uh, we do the pullback of uh, some output sensitivity, in a sense, what I'm doing is uh, I'm applying many times a Jacobian transpose to this to this uh, to this value, right? So in the limit of an infinitely deep or uh, very very deep neural network, what will happen is that, I mean, okay, let's say in the limit of infinitely deep neural network, what will happen is that applying repeatedly the Jacobian, assume for example that they all have uh, the same value, so all the Jacobians are identical, um, I will be either exploding or vanishing uh, or uh, or sending to zero the gradient. Okay, this is known as the vanishing gradient problem, and conceptually it's simply because you are applying many, many times the same quantity. And this was a problem until, I don't know, five-ish uh, years ago in machine learning. And the solution was very simple. So we, we said, well, instead of uh, applying repeatedly a function to my input, I can simply add what was known as a skip connection or a residual network, essentially add, uh, have a nonlinearity, have my nonlinear layer simply add a small difference to h of t, to my state, right? So pictorially, the way they, they represent this is by adding a connection like that. Okay, that bypasses it. So when you backpropagate uh, the, the sensitivities, uh, there is one part that accumulates the gradient, but also one part that doesn't. And so you, you don't have this vanishing gradient problem anymore. Now, being a physicist, uh, this formula here looks to me a lot like uh, Euler, the Euler integration of the differential equation, right? With delta t equal to one. So in a sense, we could say that h of t plus one minus h of t divided by one, let's say delta t, is, uh, let's call it delta t, is uh, phi of t of h of t, okay? So this, I mean, in the limit of delta t going to zero is nothing over than the h of t over the t. Right? So in a sense, what I'm trying to say is that a differential equation where uh, I'm parameterizing my nonlinearity, right? Because here I would have some parameter theta that I can count as inputs here. So a, a differential equation when, where I'm parameterizing uh, my parameterized differential equation is, uh, in, in some sense, uh, a, a continuous limit uh, of a residual network of uh, or a neural network that is deep and has uh, skip connections. This was noticed uh, some not so long ago, I think in 2018, uh, in a very nice paper by Jesse Bettencourt and uh, uh, a bunch of others. He was doing his PhD at the time. And uh, um, the, the, interest, the, the reason why people uh, and researchers got interested in this uh, was that uh, residual networks or uh, neural networks with this architecture were being used to approximate uh, time series, okay? So let's forget for a moment uh, recognizing digits uh, labeled by children, uh, which is uh, slave labor. And uh, imagine that uh, you have some, some time series, okay? Uh, sample like this. This is t, and this is some y of t. In some cases, it is of interest uh, to be able to fit this and then extrapolate, right? So the traditional way this is done is you have some loss function, you have your input state, you propagate it through your residual networks a bunch of times, and uh, you train your network uh, in this interval where you have uh, where you have a data set, and then you extrapolate. And this is exactly what happens for, uh, for example, like ChatGPT, which is uh, I, I think you know about about it. Now, sometimes the, this, uh, the, the data set that we're working with is continuous, right? So the discretization is artificial. 
So maybe because uh, we are looking at the dynamical system, for example, that I can sample not necessarily at discrete uh, time, at constant time steps. I can change it all the time. I can have, uh, uh, I mean, yeah, a big application is in uh, in in predicting and in predicting uh, uh, a dynamical system. So, if you want, um, what what the question is now is. Uh, how can I do the training of this function? How can I go to the continuous limit? So imagine that my loss function is, uh, yes. So imagine you want to minimize a function L, okay. Which is something like integral of the, the T or let's say which is um of h t i minus uh, some y i imagine you have a loss function um that essentially is the distance between some time dependent data set Y or I, a, a time series, and uh, and the solution of your uh, differential equation that is parameterized. So in a sense, uh, this uh, loss function depends on a set of parameters, which is implicitly encoded into H, because H theta of T is nothing over than uh, the formal solution of this differential equation, right? So it will be H of uh, zero plus the integral from t0 to t1 to, to t of f h tau tau the tau and sorry i forgot theta so in a sense what i want to find are the optimal parameters theta that allow me to find the solution of this differential equation that best approximates some finite data set in an interval. Okay. Once I've been able to fit to find the optimal theta, I will then be able to easily extrapolate to longer times than my data set has uh, contains because uh, I simply need to integrate for longer times. Does so, it make sense? Just a question. So this is different from the usual uh, thing because you don't depend just on the output right because the output is just uh, the uh, h theta at the last time uh, which is known instead uh, here the loss is on all the layers the finite set of points yeah, yeah finite set of yes. points in the layer okay yes so you in a sense you are taking out the value at inter intermediate times but this can always be reduced essentially to to a single point, right? You can see this as sum of i of l uh, of l of h t the i, where l is your loss function at that point. So what I'm saying, if you want, is that um, how to say it. Um, So mathematically, if you have a linear loss function, you only care about uh, computing the, the derivative uh, for a single uh, at a single point. So you can consider it as uh, different uh, blocks. Okay, okay. So, so different loss, but the, the architecture is different for for every loss. Yes, exactly. Because you truncated the. Uh, okay, okay, yes. okay. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. I guess someone is uh, is asking also. Sorry, I, I answered to have some questions in the public. Uh, uh, that what is f? I guess it's phi t. Ah, uh, sorry. Yes, e. this would be phi. Yeah, yeah, and the tau is t or something like that. Yes. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, Lorenzo. Um, I have like um, I'd say two questions. Like the first one is like, is the phi always the same in each iteration? Usually yes. Usually it is right. Okay. It's otherwise it's 
much more complicated. Oh, okay, makes sense. And then the the, the 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 other question is, what's the difference between doing this and feeding the time series to an LSTM network, if there is any? So an LSTM network is this structure, in a sense. Yeah, exa exactly, exactly. It's quite similar, I'd say. Uh, yes. So what I'm doing is I'm taking the continuum limit. I'm taking the limit where uh, if you want, I'm applying a very small uh, contribution at every at every layer. Uh, so, uh, like to me, really, it's like almost the same thing to to like feeding an LSTM network with this time series. Mm -hmm. Of course, you can. I mean, if the time series has like the proper amplitude, yes. The, it, it, this thing is the same. The as, point is that the LSTM network will learn a, a representation of a discrete dynamics. You will never be able to oh, query the LSTM network for times t. I see. Okay. That are not uh, discrete. Okay. Instead, it sense. might make sense uh, in some problems to query your uh, your model at intermediate times. Mm -hmm. First, second. Uh, depending on what is the time series you want to represent, it might make sense to have a continuous model. Okay, okay. Because uh, it might be very easy. For example, if your phi comes from some Lagrangian, for, for example, or from some Hamiltonian, uh, you can encode more easily some symmetries or some, some conservation of energy. Okay. Uh, instead, if you have a discrete uh, approximation, I mean, you can, but sometimes it's harder because okay. we have already a, a... So I'll make you an example. If you integrate with Euler a, a differential equation, a, the Hamiltonian equations of motion, you are not conserving energy, right? Mm -hmm. It's uh, diverging. Yeah. You need to use a symplectic integrator, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, unless you create an LSTM network that respects the symplectic property, you would also be diverging the energy. Okay. And here? This... Here, uh, like the, the question is in a sense hidden away. <laughs> okay. I have a I have a differential equation mm -hmm. which let's say conserves energy, for okay. example. I integrate it uh, with a symplectic integrator. Okay. And as long as I'm able to compute the derivatives uh, of the symplect of the solution computed with a symplectic integrator. Mm -hmm. So here, like the 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 difference is that you can query phi independent, like phi is the same, and once you have it, you have it, no matter what. Whereas for the LSTM network, the network, I mean, can only work only after having fed it with a time series. So you are forced to to this discrete structure. If you want exactly. to query the LSTM at time uh, uh, five hundred, you need to start from zero and go to five hundred. Yes. Whereas here, you can just plug in t exactly. five hundred. This okay. is one feature and the other feature as i said is the fact that you can combine it with uh, any higher order integrator that okay. enforce some that actually respect some properties okay. that you want to encode in the okay. system so it, of course like i i think it's a silly question but like a punctualization let's say like this is the same as learning the derivative with a network right it is okay i'm okay. saying so if you want here we are parameterizing the the derivative the different the derivative of the, i call it the differential equation if you want and uh, and we are trying to optimize it. Okay. Now, the problem is that to compute the derivative of, uh, of my loss function, I will need to compute the derivative of, of the solution of my differential equation with respect to the parameters theta, mm -hmm. which is highly non-trivial. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you want, uh, I mean, there are many different ways to, to do it. One relatively successful approach is uh, to use dual numbers. Mm -hmm. Right, you feed uh, to your uh, differential equation solver a, a dual number, and you propagate it forward, and you get the solution. Ah, okay, okay. With a with a, with a sensitivity okay. propagated together. Okay. And as long as your differential equation solver can work with dual numbers, then uh, you, you need to do essentially nothing. I see. I see. Okay. This uh, is not the ideal approach, but it's a very easy to to code, you, you, very easy to use approach. Okay. Practice. Okay. The the, the very last thing, like I, I cannot ask this question. Like, are, are there also kernel based the uh, differential equation? Like when you do exactly the same thing, but instead of using a neural network, you regress it with a kernel. 
I would expect so, and right. probably you okay. might have some features, but I some you could enforce some you could simplify the the the, the form of the gradient, okay. but I never uh, I, oh, I don't okay. know. Okay, thank so you. So a particularly interesting application of uh, neural differential equations, which is why I wanted to mention it in the first place, is that um is to is that you can very easily combine it with uh, some physical model or some simplified physical model of your system. So imagine that you have, uh, um, I don't know, two populations, right? Uh, walls and rabbits, the, Lock the Lotka Volterra model, okay? Imagine you take experimental data from the field and, and, and you have uh, something. Now, your data will not necessarily fit the Lotka Volterra model because, uh, I mean, there are over correlations that you don't know about. In physicist terms, imagine you have a, a, a quantum mechanical model. You have a mean field prediction that is very simple, but you know that you have terms beyond mean field, higher order correlations. What you can do is you can have your differential equations, your differential equation to be some, let's say, known term, which is not parameterized usually, okay? So this would be your mean field prediction, the lotka volterra equations, whatever you already know, and you know it's a good starting point. And then you use uh, some neural network architecture to parameterize the unknown terms in your differential equations. If you train these, assuming your known uh, part is good enough, uh, essentially you are only parameterizing terms you don't know in the differential equations. And and then uh, this can be used. Uh, this has two possible applications. One is to try to find a, an analytical model that you didn't think about of uh, the dynamics of uh, whatever is happening in the system. So you can use it to discover an analytical model, simplified or very complex. I mean, how to how to use these in practice? Uh, it's it's complicated because you will have a neural network with many parameters here. You will try to optimize it, and then you will try to prune away as many terms as possible to, to find a very simple analytical uh, structure in the end. This is one application. Another application is to uh, speed up the solution of uh, some very hard uh, differential equations. And the best example are the Navier-Stokes equation. The Navier-Stokes equations are extremely expensive to solve. So what researchers have done uh, recently in a paper uh, titled uh, Universal Differential Equations for, uh, uh, for, physic, uh, for physical based, uh, physically inspired modeling, what they did is they used the supercomputers, they ran, they ran it for a month, they computed the solution of an Navier-Stokes equation from T0 to T1, okay? And this is the best they could do. They used all their money to, to, to run the supercomputer for a month. And then they train. They they took the let's say the mean field, uh, some simplified form of the Navier-Stokes equation in an ideal limit. This is the known term. And they added the neural network parameterization for unknown terms. And they trained this neural network term on on the solution that they computed exactly. Let's say with established numerical methods. By doing this. Uh, the training is, mu was mu is much cheaper than, than solving an Navier-Stokes equation. They, they train the model to learn uh, what is going on between T0 and T1. And they're only learning uh, what they don't know. Like everything we know, we already plugged it in. So we, are not, we don't want to learn stuff we know, already know about. And now you can query the model at longer times. And this model will be much cheaper than, the, than solving the Navier-Stokes equation assuming you constructed it uh, correctly, and therefore you can extrapolate. Now the question is, does the neural network extrapolate well or, uh, or not? So if you were using an LSTM model or any discrete uh, architecture, this would, this would work. They, already, they had already tried, but uh, didn't work particularly well because uh, it's very hard to enforce conservation of energy and other properties. Instead, this uh, does it automatically. It's, uh, it's because you are working in a continuum limit and, and they use it to extrapolate and to almost two orders of magnitude uh, beyond uh, 
beyond uh, where the simulations were stopped. So of course, this is not a magical tool that can be used to extrapolate any differential equation. So in, in physical experiments, we use it uh, in quantum physics, for example, we use it to, to learn an effective model of uh, our quantum computers and how we can control them, which is useful to do reinforcement learning uh, more cheaply than, than running the actual quantum computers. But it's an usual, it's an useful tool to have. Okay, so if I still have time, yeah, okay. Um, so I will not get into how we can actually compute the derivatives uh, of uh, differential equation uh, solution. Um, there are several algorithms. You can look it up into, there is a very nice uh, review paper, which is, uh, I, I, can, I, can, uh, I can write it down later. Um, what I can show you is, uh, yeah, maybe I can very briefly show you how this can be done in practice. Can I pass so, uh, pass Okay, so this is just a flash uh, of uh, how this can be done in practice uh, um, using a tool, uh, no, a framework known as, uh, as Diffrax, which is uh, a JAX-based implementation of uh, differentiable uh, ODE solvers. So essentially what this package does, it allows you to compute gradients of any function where inside you have uh, ODE solve functions, okay? So, assume I have some data set here, okay? Like this is uh, some Lotka Volterra model with uh, unknown parameters, let's say, and some random noise added on top, right? So imagine we want to try to fit, for example, the parameters of the Lot Lotka Volterra equation. So alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, right? So what I can do is uh, I can create an object, so my Lotka Volterra model. Um, there is a lot of jargon here, so I, I don't want to really go into the details, but if you want a neural network or any variational object uh, in can, can be thought as something where you have to define how to initialize it, so how to define what are the parameters and what are the, what is the, the how to evaluate it, right? So this, uh, this function, what it's doing is uh, it's uh, compute, it's defining this init function that says uh, we have uh, four parameters. Uh, at the beginning, they're initialized according to a normal distribution. And then uh, the call function essentially evaluates it uh, at time t, given some, uh, some, some, uh, some input state y, which is uh, an object with two variables. And if you want, this is simply taking uh, a, b, c, d, so the four parameters and multiplying them according to this equation. And then I'm stacking them again so that I have a, I have a vector. So if you want what this does, um, let's see if I construct it. I can query the uh, parameters, right? So I have those four parameters, and I can also evaluate it uh, for uh, something that looks like uh, so at time one point zero. So if you want, what I'm showing here is that uh, if you build this uh, this uh, Lotka Volterra model, so it's really an object that has uh, four parameters inside, so those uh, Lotka Volterra pars, and uh, if I feed it uh, an array with uh, two numbers, so the two populations of the species one and species two, it outputs me a vector that is, uh, sorry, this one, a vector that is the derivative, okay? Uh, yes. Why is it zero? Okay, so 
to build an RL ODE, essentially what I need to do is I need to put this function, my model, my... It's in X1, there is D and D. So maybe it's C ah, and yes. D. yes, it should be C. Thank you. Great. Okay, so what I need to do to, to construct an RL ODE now is simply put this inside of a solution. So if you want, this is my neur neural ODE model. So the, it should compute the integral, so the solution of a differential equation. Um, so I'm simply storing inside the, 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 the differential function itself. It's not very important. What is important is that when I evaluate here, so when I compute the integral up to time t, ts, I'm calling this diffrax dot diffx solve, which I mean diffrax is the library I'm using. Diffx solve is simply uh, performing a solution. Okay, so what I pass it is uh, this diffrax dot ode term, which is simply a very fancy way to say this is my ode. Okay, the function, which is what I showed you before, and then uh, we can use a certain ode integrator. So it's it five. You can use. I mean, there's a lot of stuff you can find. Like diffrax dot, uh, I don't know, Rungekuta, Ralston, there's mm, symplectic, I guess. Same implicit, you have a lot of things. So I, I don't want to, I don't have time anymore, but essentially you define T0 and T1. So where you start, where you end, uh, and uh, you decide when, when to store, uh, when, when to store at what time step to so store the solution, right? So if I do this, if I run this function, um, yes. So if I construct this neural, oops, neural ODE model, what happens here, right? I, I pass my key. This again is just a random number generator, uh, like something to initialize it. I construct it. I can I can query the the parameters again, right? So it's inside of model.func because I was storing it here inside of a variable. And then I can query all the parameters. This is boring in a sense. What is interesting is that now I can, I can compute the solution of the neural OD. So if you want, uh, if I pass TS, so the, all the times, T0, T, like all the time steps, and YS0, so the, the initial configuration, I run this, it takes a moment, I get as output the population at all subsequent times, okay? And so I can plot it. So you see that for the initial parameters I have, I, I find that the two populations are both dying in a sense, okay? This is because the random parameters I fed at the beginning are, uh, I mean, they, they are very bad. Does this make sense? I'm going faster because I'm out of time, but I just wanted to show this very quickly. So now, how do I define a, a loss function? Okay, so a loss function is simply, as I said before, I take the model, right? I, I compute the solution. So this, this line here essentially is uh, computing all those points here, like the populations at all times of the two species. And then as, as the loss, I simply take an L2 loss, so I compute the difference between my prediction my, my data set, I square it and I take the average, nothing fancy. And now the way that, the way I can compute, so this is, I just define the loss itself and uh, by the magics of automatic differentiation, I can use this uh, filter value and grad. I will not get into the details of it, but what it does, it simply it returns you the value of the function and its gradient, okay? So if you want, I can simply do this and filter JIT uh, just uh, means compile it so it's faster. Uh, so if I call my grad loss, I, I pass it my model, my the time steps and my um, my predictions and I run it. Uh, I should obtain both a, a value for my loss if this uh, executes. Yes, you see, I have I get out a tuple, which is uh, the value of the loss, 1.4, and uh, uh, this object, which is, and this object, which essentially is the gradient, which is encoded into a, another neural ODE, an object that has the same structure as my input. 
And then I can define an Alper function just to do one step. So if you want, this is taking the gradient and it's using an optimizer to update the model and then it's returning the new model. Yes. And finally, what I can do is uh, I can uh, I can simply construct an optimizer. Here I use the ADA belief. You can try Adam, you can try many things, you can play a bit with it. Essentially, I construct my optimizer. This is just syntax, boring. I initialize it at the beginning. And then if you want the important step is this, I loop 10,000 steps until I converge, OK? So if I do this, yeah, this will take a, a long time. Yes. No, on the CPU, it's running on my laptop. I mean, it's for parameters, so. Right. And then, it, so we can plot it now, right? And it doesn't work. So if you want here, I'm plotting the, the blue line, the, the two wiggly lines are essentially the, 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 the data set and, and the two dark red lines are, uh, are the two predictions by the neural OD model. And uh, if you see, it, it, it's, it's stuck, okay? So I don't have the time uh, to 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 show the the rest of this. Uh, um, maybe maybe on Thursday. Um, but the idea is that training neural ODs it's not easy. So you you need to add some regularization terms uh, to the gradient because uh, it's very easy to fall into some local minimas where, um, like in this case, where uh, where uh, you don't move anymore. And a possible solution is to add many more parameters. So in general, uh, the more parameters you have, uh, the easier it is to solve. When you have very few parameters, like in this case, only four, uh, it's quite tricky to get the optimization to work right. But yeah, I'm sorry I went over time, but thank you. Okay. Welcome back to this uh, second afternoon. And so we'll uh, hear about the second lecture by by Sino Chui. Please uh, we'll continue from Fokker Planck, I guess. Yeah, okay. Um, so today, I guess since everyone went home last night and then read 100 pages of the book, we'll start on chapter four. That's a joke, of course. Okay, so we'll be discussing uh, Wasserstein gradient flows today. Um, this corresponds to sections 1.3 and 1.4 in the book. But if you want to see all the, the details of the theory, you read the book by the Bible by Ambrosio, Jiggly, and Savare called Gradient Flows in metric spaces. Okay, so this topic, um, this is really like one of the I'd say most like intellectually significant significant developments of the past 50 years. Um, I'm sure a lot of people would agree with me. So this is really like to, to tell you the truth, like um, wh why do I study the, the Langevin diffusion? It's not because I run Bayesian logistic regression every day. It's because of like fundamental ideas like, like the ones that I'll try to present to you today. Okay, so what is our goal today? Uh, last time we derived the, the Fokker Planck equation, which governs the evolution of the density of the Langevin diffusion. Um, this is an equation for the probability measure itself. And then what we want to do is like interpret this equation as a gradient flow in the space of probability measures, where the, the metric that we're gonna put on the space of probability measures is the, the Wasserstein metric from optimal transport. And then the objective functional is going to turn out to be the KL divergence. But in order to make sense of that, we need to set up all this like differential structure in, in the space of measures. OK, so let's start with uh, a brief, let, let's say, like two sentence review of optimal transport. I guess like you saw a mini course about this last week, but then it'll be really important for us to to have this uh, 
quadratic Wasserstein distance, which is going to be defined as the infimum over all couplings. This is going to be my, my notation. So these are couplings. These are uh, joint distributions, which have marginals equal to mu and nu, respectively, of the quadratic cost. Okay, and then the, the fundamental theorem about this, this uh, optimal transport distance is Grenier's theorem. which says that if mu has a density, with respect to the Lebesgue measure, then the, the optimal uh, transport plan gamma exists and is unique. And it's induced by a mapping, uh, an optimal transport map. Okay, this means that uh, like the, the support of the coupling is concentrated on the graph of a deterministic mapping T. And T is characterized You cannot see this. And T is the unique mapping up to almost sure with respect to mu, uh, which pushes forward mu to nu. And T is the gradient of a convex function. Okay, uh, do, you, do you all remember this theorem or um, does anyone need a, a refresher about this? Okay, I hope we're all good on this. So the perspective today is going to be that the optimal transport distance is kind of a way to lift concepts from Euclidean space to the space of probability measures. Um, and here, like we have the ground metric, which is the Euclidean metric. And through this like optimal transport definition, we now lift it to a notion of distance between probability measures. Okay, and similarly, like we have we have these dynamics of what's going on at the level of particles, where we imagine these particles are, are random, so they have some kind of a probability distribution. We want to take whatever picture we see at the level of particles and lift that up to the space of probability measures. That's going to be like the, the philosophy. Okay, so the first step is that this, this optimal transport problem, as defined here, is just a static problem. And what I mean by static is that uh, we have like the the um, initial place where all the mass is, which is mu. And then we have the, the destination, which is nu. And this problem talks about like, if you had a, a piece of mass at one starting location, then where is the final location it gets mapped to? But it doesn't say anything about how the mass is transported in between. So understanding how the mass is transported in between, this is the uh, dynamical formation of the problem. So I guess we'll get to that a little bit later, but first let's uh, let's go back to this idea of trying to lift dynamics from uh, Euclidean space to the space of measures. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to imagine that I have some particle xt, and this is going to be drawn from a distribution uh, mu t. Okay, so uh, what I 
whatever I have, whatever description I have of the movement of xt, I want to translate into the, the movement of mu t. So when we talk about like movement of particles, what is kind of a general model that would encompass all the possible ways that particles can move around? I mean, it's kind of a, a difficult question maybe to, to answer, but uh, one, way, one way to really like capture this general idea of movement of particles is through ODEs. I mean, ODEs are very fundamental. They describe like, the physics of our, of our universe. In particular, we're going to consider ODEs of this form, where the, the time derivative of xt is going to be vt applied to xt. And vt, this is a mapping from rd to rd. It's a vector field. And it's allowed to be time dependent. Okay, so another way of saying this is that the curve x is uh, an integral curve of this family of vector fields. Okay, so this equation is actually deterministic. But you should keep in mind that uh, because the initial condition x0 is still drawn from a probability measure, this is still a, a random process. Okay, and uh, Right. So this kind of uh, describes like all possible movements you can make at the particle level. And then our first step is going to see like, if we have this movement at the particle level, then what does it look like at the level of the measures mu? Okay, so how, how do we find out the dynamics of, of mu t? Well, we're going to use like basically the same same argument that we did yesterday. We're going to compute the derivatives of uh, ex expectations of test functions along this trajectory. And then once we understand the evolution of test functions, then we can translate it into an equation for the evolution of the measures. Okay, so imagine that we have some nice smooth test function, phi. And then what we're interested in is computing how these integrals evolve in time if we have these dynamics. And another way to think about this is just what is the time derivative of this uh, expectation. OK, but I, uh, this, this formulation is particularly convenient because I've told you how the particles evolve. The particles evolve according to this ODE. So this this is just calculus. It just becomes the inner product of the gradient and the derivative of xt, which is just this vector field vt. Okay, and then I'm going to rewrite this as an integral. So it's the inner product of grad phi and this vector field vt integrated with respect to mu t. Okay, now, if everything is, is regular enough that I can uh, integrate by parts, then we could push the, the gradient off of this test function phi. And then if you, if you can do that, you will end up with the divergence. Um, let's put the test function first. Phi times the divergence of mu t times this vector field of vt. Okay, so this is the same thing that we did last time. It's just that here we're considering this like OD rather than the, the Langevin dynamics. Okay, so now if we compare both sides of this equation, we can, if this holds for every test function phi, then we found a, a PDE that the measure mu must satisfy. And this PDE is the time derivative of mu t plus the divergence of mu t v t is equal to zero. Okay, and this equation is often called the continuity equation. Or a transport equation. 
And uh, there's also like a, an interpretation of all of this in terms of fluid dynamics. So this is also something you commonly do in, in fluid dynamics here, where like keeping track of individual trajectories of particles. So this would be called the Lagrangian perspective in fluid dynamics, where you just keep track of one. Um, yes. Uh, but so t is uh, the law of fixed t respect to the Lebesgue measure. Uh, sorry, could you repeat? It's uh, muti is the density of uh, the law of uh, xt respect to the, the Lebesgue measure. Correct. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm going to be abusing notation and thinking of muti both as a probability measure, but also as uh, the Lebesgue density. Right, so, so this is a Lagrangian perspective, and this is the uh, Eulerian perspective. Okay, so in the Eulerian perspective, we stop keeping track of individual trajectories of, of particles. Instead, we consider the, the entire field. So this is the, the velocity field. It keeps track of, um, at any given location, what is the velocity of the, the particle that's, um, that's moving at that location. And then mu t is, is sort of like the, the mass density of all of your, your particles. And what this tells you is a way of converting back and forth between this Lagrangian perspective and the, the Eulerian perspective. Okay, so I also like, so we, we use this test function argument to derive this continuity equation about the evolution of measures, but actually a lot of times it's uh, more useful to just directly have the, the evolution of the expectation of test functions. Okay, so that's great. Uh, what we've done is we've taken like kind of general dynamics at the level of particles, lifted it up to the, the dynamics on the space of measures. But, but there's one important point to note here, which is that when you look at the equation at the level of measures, then there's an ambiguity, which is that this, this vector field VT is not uniquely defined. So why is it not uniquely defined? We can, uh, there's a simple observation. We can replace VT with any other vector field VT tilde such that the divergence of mu t vt minus vt tilde is zero. Okay, if we, because um, like obviously if this is true, if I replace vt by vt tilde on the right-hand side of the equation, I will still get the same evolution of measures. So what is this saying? It's saying like, if you just look at the evolution of the entire collection of particles, there's a lot of different things that could be happening to the individual particle trajectories that could still be responsible for the same evolution of the, the overall mass. Okay, so let me give you like a simple example. Let's say that uh, mu t is the standard Gaussian for all time. Okay, so if I just look at all of the par particles in aggregate, it just looks like a standard Gaussian. Now, what could the individual particles be doing such that I, I see this? So one possibility, obviously, is that Vt equals zero. Like the particles are just not moving. And of course, the, the mass will just remain Gaussian. But another possibility is that Vt is a rotation vector field. So we know that the standard Gaussian is rotationally invariant. If all of the particles are, are rotating in circles, then the overall like collection of particles will still be like standard Gaussian for all time. Okay, so you see that there's multiple different possible velocity vector fields that would give rise to the same, same curve of measures. So we, we want to kind of resolve this ambiguity, but if you think about this second possibility, the, the rotation vector field, it seems like not the most parsimonious explanation for why the, the density is evolving as it is. Here, like, uh, all we wanted was like for mu t to be standard Gaussian for all time, but 
in order to achieve that, we're making all the particles like swirl around forever. It seems like there's a lot of wasted movement, right? And this this notion of wasted movement is, of course, exactly related to optimal transport. We want to find the cheapest way to, to move them. Okay, so that's just like foreshadowing at the connection. Um, but let, let's just try to formalize like what we would mean by uh, finding like the most parsimonious explanation. So a physical way to do this is to minimize the kinetic energy. Okay, so what I'm imagining is like we have What I'm imagining is like, we, we already have some curve of probability measures. What we're trying to do now is to find the vector field that would explain this curve of, of measures. And I, as I already said, there's multiple ways to explain this curve of measures, but we want to find the, the vector fields that will minimize the kinetic energy. So what that means is that among all VT such that the continuity equation holds. Remember, like the, the continuity equation is exactly what links the, the vector field to the, the evolution of, of densities, right? So saying that a vector field, a family of vector fields gives rise to this curve of measures is exactly saying that the continuity equation is satisfied. So among all such vector fields, we want to find, we want to minimize Uh, let's let's say that t is going to be between zero and one. Okay, so uh, why is this the kinetic energy? I guess like it's probably kinetic energy if I add a factor of one half here. So mu t is supposed to be the the mass density, and then this is like the square norm of the of the velocity. So this part right here, this is the kinetic energy density. It has units of like energy divided by volume. But then when I integrate this, I get the total kinetic energy of the particles. And then I'm also going to integrate this from zero to one with respect to time. Right, and another way to think about this is like, uh, if we go back to the Lagrangian perspective, this integral would precisely be the expectation of the uh, the time derivative of your particles along this fluid flow. Okay, so I guess like the, the next step, uh, the next logical step in this development would be to like study this minimizer and so on. So that's what's done in Ambrosio Jiggly uh, Savare, that book. Let me try to give you the summary of it. So uh, what have we said so far? We said that if we, given any like family of vector fields VT, we know how to write down a curve of measures, uh, like the evolution of, of the of the um, density, oh, if we follow that vector field, right? And now I'm trying to go the other way, which is given a curve of measures, can I find a family of vector fields such that it can this curve of measures can be interpreted as the movement of particles along those vector fields? We saw that one immediate obstacle was the lack of uniqueness, and then we came up with one way of finding a distinguished choice of vector fields. OK, and it's a theorem of Ambrosio Jiggly Savare that uh, as long as you have any absolutely continuous curve in, in the Wasserstein space, then there will exist like vector fields VT such that this continuity equation holds. And moreover, you can make a, a selection of minimal norm such that this holds.
Okay, but now I want to kind of interpret what we did a little bit differently. So this tells you like uh, these these vector fields completely govern the evolution of this of this density. So we can kind of think of these vector fields as tangent vectors to this curve somehow. Okay, so we have we have this like curve of measures mu t. It's it belongs to the space of all probability measures. Uh, normally, when we think about the tangent vector to a curve, we would just think about the Euclidean time time derivative of this curve, like the the derivative of the density. But what I'm saying is like if we want to develop a picture that really respects the geometry of our underlying base space, then perhaps it's a uh, physically meaningful to think of the tangent vector to this curve to be the vector field vt in this minimal selection. Okay, so, so now we're like kind of entering the, the realm of Riemannian geometry. We want to think of the tangent space to the space of probability measures at a point mu. And this is the tangent space to the, the space of probability measures with finite second moment. Actually, let me um, let me just write this out. So the space we're considering is P2, which is uh, probability measures on RD finite second moment. Okay, this this is the space on which the the Wasserstein distance makes sense, but. Um, actually, like if you think back to Bernier's theorem, we had this assumption that mu admits a, a density, and that that'll also be convenient today. So, we'll actually look at the space P two comma AC. AC stands for absolutely continuous, and that means it has a, a density. Okay, so this is our our space that we're looking at. And then what I said is that the tangent space at mu is is like these vector fields. Okay, and also like this formulation suggests a natural norm to to place on this tangent space. So the norm of a vector field at mu is just going to be the integral of v squared d mu, which is just the L2 norm of v at mu. OK, so if you have a, a tangent space at every point on your space, and you also have a norm on that tangent space, then these two ingredients kind of define for you a, a Riemannian metric. So th this kind of gives you a, a pseudo Riemannian structure on the space of probability measures. Um, <clears throat> but I still wasn't completely precise enough. Uh, so I kind of just loosely said the tangent space is all vector fields, but that's not really the case. As we saw, there's like, some ambiguity in the choice of vector fields that we're going to use. And in particular, we made a distinguished choice. So yeah, let, let's see what the, the tangent space actually is. So these vector fields, um, remember, like they have to satisfy the constraint that they satisfy the, the continuity equation. And the continuity equation is equivalent to this equation for, for the test functions. So let me just write that out again. So mu t v t satisfies the continuity equation. If and only if for all test functions phi, the time derivative of phi is the inner product of the gradient with v t.
Okay, now this left hand side, this only depends on the curve of measures. We, we can agree with that, right? So now you look at the right-hand side, and you see like the only thing that matters about the vector field Vt is its action on gradients of functions. Not, not on like all possible vector fields here, but only on gradients of, of test functions, OK? And also, like we are looking for the vector field that minimizes the norm of Vt. OK, so we want to find a vector field Vt of minimal norm subject to this kind of constraint. But this constraint only cares about how we act on gradients, gradients of functions. So what does that tell you? It tells you that um, only the component of Vt onto the, the space of gradients matters. And the rest of Vt, you should set it to be 0 if you want to minimize the norm. So this is kind of like a heuristic argument to say that Vt should lie in um, the like the span of the gradients. Okay, so let, let me go back to the tangent space and write out what it should be. So the, the real definition of the tangent space is going to be um, you take all gradients. And then like for technical convenience, it's, it's nice to just consider, let's say, like uh, smooth, compactly supported functions, test functions. But we need to then take the closure with respect to the L2 norm. Okay, so if you if you take like this, this is basically like a smooth approximation result hiding here. Um, the the space of gradients that we're going to be interested, you could just think of taking all like the span of all possible gradients of smooth functions, but then you complete it with respect to the L two norm, so you can take limits, and then this will be the full full tangent space. Okay, and this this right here uh, is a very like useful interpretation because. Um, like where where have we seen gradients of functions showing up before? Well, in Bernier's theorem, right? So you can start to see like there's more connections with optimal transport going on, but there is one difference. In Bernier's theorem, we only looked at gradients of convex functions, whereas here I made no such requirement that the the gradient should be the gradient of a convex function. I'm allowing gradients of general functions. So let me just quickly explain why that's the case. Ba basically, the reason why that's going to be the case is that if you have the optimal transport problem, and then you have the gradient of a convex function, OK, then Roughly speaking, uh, what we're going to do next is we're going to define what it means to take the geodesic between mu and nu in this space. So this is going to be like the shortest path connecting mu and nu. And then when you look at the tangent vector to this curve, the tangent vector is, is not gradient of phi. The tangent vector is going to be gradient of phi minus the identity, because this is the, the displacement vector. OK, so when you consider like gradient of phi minus identity, then this is no longer the gradient of a convex function. You get gradients of all possible functions. So that's going to be the, the picture. So, so far, like I have not formally connected this like Riemannian picture to optimal transport. Uh, that'll come like next. But hopefully, you start seeing the, the intuition. So this is like a good place to pause for questions. Yes. So um, okay, I I I haven't quite followed the last uh, thing you you said. So what you're saying is that in our picture we are basically interested in 
the gradient minus the identity because going from one point to another in the space of major is, I mean, like, okay, just, I think it's better just if you. Right. Okay, just, again, just think about you put in space. Try. Like, let's say I go from X to Y and yes. I just follow like the straight line going from X to Y. Yeah. Then what is the velocity here? The velocity is, is the difference Y, y minus, minus X. X. Exactly. Right. So in the same way, like the tangent vector here is going to be the, the optimal transport map minus the identity tells you the displacement. Mm, okay. Oh, I see. Okay. 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 Thank you. And also like, what is the tangent space? Like it should be like a vector space, right? So we shouldn't just get gradients of convex functions because then it wouldn't be a vector space. It'd be like a convex cone, which does happen on, on like on some degenerate metric spaces, but like here we really want, we hope to have like a, a vector space. So uh, the, 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 the tangent, the tangent vector you wrote is the intuition behind the fact that you want to move towards the optimal transport map. So that's like, what you expect. Am I getting this right? Like somehow, like if I follow this velocity, yeah, then um, hopefully I will trace out the, the geodesic between new and new. Mm -hmm. And after I fully traced it out, the, the total amount that I've moved will be the optimal transport. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So um, for doing a recap, we have the space of measure. We consider the trajectory in the space of measure. So since we consider the trajectory, we are considered there in the tangent space. And uh, this tangent space is useful because uh, we can write explicitly the geodesic. Of, uh... So I, I haven't told you yet why this is useful, um, okay. but but like you know like we're we're interested in dynamics on the space of measures. This is going to be useful for like writing down gradient flows on the space. You can use this to design optimization algorithms. Uh, we're going to use this to like study the Langevin diffusion, and and so on. So okay. this is really the starting place for a lot of work in the past few okay. decades. Okay, thank you. Yeah, let me let me also put like a, another reference here. Um, uh, so Felix Otto had this paper on like the porous medium equation. Um, where he he like really lays out this kind of Riemannian structure. There's like three just like really groundbreaking papers that I'll talk about today. Um, this is one of them. The other two will come in the the second part of the talk. Okay, let's um let's let's connect this more formally to optimal transport. So we have some Riemannian structure. Uh let's try to find the the distance function associated with this Riemannian uh, Riemannian metric. So if you're not familiar with Riemannian geometry, then given a metric it a Riemannian metric induces uh um um like a metric in this in the sense of uh metric spaces on your space. So the formula for how to get the Riemannian distance associated with the Riemannian metric is the squared distance between two points is you take the infimum over all curves gamma uh joining mu to nu. Uh, maybe maybe this isn't so good. Let, let me say like the distance between mu zero and mu one will be the infimum over all curves connecting mu zero to mu one. Uh, with with tangent vectors. V t. Okay, and then you penalize this curve according to the norm squared of the of the vector. Tangent vector. Okay, this is the general formula for the Riemannian distance in terms of the, the Riemannian metric. So we're going to apply this in, in our context. 
with with the Riemannian structure that I wrote here. But uh, this part, like tangent vectors, uh, recall like this is um, like re recall that in our context, like what it means for what what this means. You should think of the the continuity equation, and then this is just uh, the L two norm. Okay, so we want to solve this minimization problem. So how do we solve this minimization problem? Like one, one way that I find intuitive is to go back to the Lagrangian perspective. So what is the objective function here? At the particle level, we know that the particles are evolving according to this uh, velocity vector field. So the objective is the integral of from 0 to 1 of this quantity. But this quantity is just the expected derivative oops, of your curve. Um, yeah, let's let's keep it the remaining structure. Okay, so we have. We have this quantity, and you can always lower bound this by the integral uh, by the expectation of the integral like so. Okay, and when is this inequality and an equality? This is uh this is equality if x t dot is constant okay so we have a lower bound on our objective and because we have the integral of the the time derivative this is just the difference between the endpoints okay so and recall that mu zero, this is a, a random variable from mu zero, and uh, x one is a random variable from mu one, because like we're we're searching over all curves of measures that connect mu zero to to mu one, right? So this in particular is a coupling of the two measures mu zero and mu one, so it's always lower bounded by the Wasserstein distance, and it's a equality if the coupling is optimal. Okay, so we found a lower bound for our, our minimization problem. It's the squared Wasserstein distance. And we also have conditions for equality. So this, this can be attained. So this, this tells you exactly what, it, what is the optimal solution. The optimal solution is you couple x0, x1 optimally. Okay, that's needed to make this lower bound tight. And then up here, we need the, the derivative of xt to be constant. So we need to go from x0 to x1 at a constant velocity, which means we're just going to traverse a, a straight line at constant speed. So this tells you that for all t, xt dot is just x1 minus x0, okay? And this, this we, we know what this is. This is called the Euclidean geodesic. Okay, so what have I shown you through through this calculation? Uh, first of all, I've shown you that the Riemannian distance associated with this Riemannian structure 
is the squared Wasserstein distance. So as, as promised, this is indeed related to, to optimal transport. It, it gives you like the dynamical picture of optimal transport. And the second thing is that not only does this minimization problem tell you what the Riemannian distance is, if you solve this, uh, if you solve this optimization problem, it also tells you what the, the Riemannian geodesic is. So through this calculation, we found what is the, uh, the Wasserstein geodesic connecting mu zero to mu one. Okay, the, the Wasserstein geodesic is the curve of measures mu t, where mu t is the law of xt. And xt is prescribed as, as here. Okay, but um, let, let's like write this out a little bit more explicitly so it's, it's clear. So when we say that uh, x, x0 and x1 are coupled optimally, uh, remember like Bernier's theorem tells us when we have an optimal coupling. The optimal coupling is when x1 is the gradient of the, the Bernier map applied to x0 and phi is like the convex function. So this is from Bernier's theorem. And then I also told you that uh, between x0 and x1, we, we travel at, at constant speed. So actually, xt is just 1 minus t times x0 plus t times x1, but x1 is just grad v of x0. And this tells us that mu t is the push forward of mu0 by this mapping. 1 minus t identity plus t times grad t push forward mu zero, okay? So this is called the Wasserstein geodesic. And it, it also goes by other names such as displacement interpolation. I mean, it just has like a, a wonderful interpretation, right? Like we, the, the gradient of phi, this is the optimal transport map that pushes forward mu zero to mu one. Now, if I want to consider the geodesic in between, I just linearly interpolate between this map and the identity map, and then I push forward my initial measure mu zero, and then I get, I get the Wasserstein geodesic. And on the level of particles, they're just traveling in straight lines. Okay, so what is, what is the picture? Mu zero, I have like some distribution of particles, mu one, I have some other distribution of particles. Okay, then I, I like optimally couple the, these two distributions. And once I optimally couple them, the particles just travel in straight lines from the, the source to the destination. And in between, I'll get some other collection of particles. And this distribution is mu t, the, the geodesic. Are there any questions about, about uh, this? Okay. Uh, I also made another omission. Uh, let me also mention that this thing that we derived that the solution to this variational problem is the Wasserstein distance. Um, this is also really famous. It's called the Benamou Bernier formula. Benamou Bernier. Okay, next up, we're going to derive a uh, Wasserstein gradient flows. So let's define what, what it means to do a gradient flow on a Riemannian manifold. Then we'll discuss calculation rules to actually calculate the Wasserstein gradient. And then I want to convince you that the, the Langevin diffusion is a Wasserstein gradient flow of the, of the KL divergence. All right, so suppose we have some functional, which 
is over the space of probability measured. Okay, so it's a functional from Wasserstein space to the reals. And I guess like maybe in, maybe plus infinity here. Okay, so we have some functional here. We want to find what it means to, to be a gradient flow of this functional. So definition, so mu t is a gradient flow of f if its tangent vector vt is such that vt, how should I say this? Um, oh, yeah, I, I probably should have defined gradient first. Sorry. OK, let, let's define the, the Wasserstein gradient. The W2 gradient of f at mu is the element, I'll denote it by gradient in W2 of f at mu that belongs to the tangent space at mu uh, such that for all curves mu t passing through mu zero. Oops, I should keep this. So like for any curve that passes through mu at time zero with a tangent vector v0, I want the following property that if I differentiate this functional along this curve, it should just be the inner product of the Wasserstein gradient with this tangent vector in the inner product at mu. OK, so is this like a, a reasonable definition of the, the Riemannian gradient of f? OK, we, we want to distinguish the, the element of the tangent space that has this property. For all curves, I can calculate the, the derivative of my functional along the curve using, using like the, the standard calculus rule that we're familiar with. Okay, so that's the definition of the Wasserstein gradient. And then we can define the, the Wasserstein gradient flow. Okay, so the, the gradient flow of f is just a curve of measures where at every time, the tangent vector to this curve is precisely the negative gradient of, of f. Okay, this is just a terminology thing. When we talk about gradient flows, we, we usually think of descending on, on f. And also, like, let me remind you what it means for vt to be the tangent vector to mu t. It means two things. The first thing is that mu t vt has to satisfy the continuity equation. That's what. Uh, that's in order for it to make sense that mu t is evolving to the vector field vt. The second requirement is that vt should be the gradient of a function because that's that's the tangent space that we had. 
So if those two things are satisfied, then that's the tangent vector to the curve. Okay, so let's let's compute the Wasserstein gradient of a functional f. We're going to compute this Wasserstein gradient in terms of the first variation of f. So what is the first variation? I should. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, uh, a question. Yes. Uh, shouldn't the definition be with? I mean, well, in the in the right hand side of the definition of the Wasserstein gradient of f of the functional f. I mean, shouldn't that be the f evaluated at mu t? Uh, sorry. I, the left hand side is um the time derivative evaluated at zero. Oh, okay. Then makes sense. So at the beginning, okay. So for simplicity, I somehow, uh, okay, because it like to me it makes sense more in the Lagrangian way. But okay, okay, I see. So you 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 take the probability distribution that starts at mu zero, mm -hmm. so at mu, I'd say, okay. Mm -hmm. Then you are computed the gradient of the functional f with respect to the Wasserstein distance which means that somehow you move the particles according to the map that optimally transports you from mu to which probability distribution? Okay, now I see what, what, what's missing in my head. So the, the, if, I, if, I, if I wanted to recover the Lagrangian view, okay, then in my, in my head, there should be somehow a transfer of mass from the probability distribution mu to another probability distribution. And then this is something which I can use to derivate a, a vector field. And this vector field is the V0 there. So like in my head is missing one probability distribution. Uh, this. this is all infinitesimal. So I want to find a vector field that will like trans translate my particles infinitesimally. Mm -hmm. with two properties first of all like this vector field should be optimal like there which just means there's no wasted movement if there's another way to transport the particles but mm -hmm. like requires less movement then I, uh, it's not optimal it should mm -hmm. be like locally optimal like this and i want the vector field which will kind of like uh, locally increase my function f as fast as possible okay. oh okay that, okay that is a great thing yeah okay i see so that's the Okay, that, that's why you avoided it. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. May I add uh, 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 an answer? <laughs> so, uh, because here, as Sino was saying, uh, the so the V0 is just uh, uh, all the possible velocities. You don't need to think of uh, where are you going. It's like when you're doing uh, uh, gradients in Rn. You don't take x and you want to go to a point y and then you, you see what is the initial velocity which is uh, y minus x you take all the velocities and then you do like infinitesimal stuff with t that goes to zero but what you care is just uh, the the initial velocity is the same you don't look into it because you are just looking at the infinitesimal level the tangent space Um, so just to clarify with the uh, the definition of the tangent spaces, um, is this um, L2 closure of gradients for um, P2 or for P2AC? Okay, I, I've been kind of uh, loose with the distinction so far. Okay. Um, basically, what happens is like if you're not absolutely continuous, like let's say like you're you're at a um, mixture of Dirac distributions or something like that, 
A mixture of draft distributions cannot be transported via deterministic maps to any arbitrary probability measure. Like if you transport by deterministic maps, you remain a mixture of drafts. Um, so that tells you like the, the tangent space at this point is not really like complete. So if you, if you want to talk about tangent spaces that are complete that let you trans, uh, that let you like move to any other point, then it's better to restrict to like the absolutely continuous measures mm -hmm. for which mm -hmm. like Bernier's theorem does tell you, you can, you can reach anywhere. So there, there are some like subtleties also. Yeah. Um, so the, the buster sign space is not a real manifold because of, because of these kind of technical issues. And like what I'm presenting here is not the, the rigorous theory. So to make this rigorous, you need to, um, read AGS. So you, you can think everything I'm talking about today is like smooth densities. Um, that's where the computations will make sense. Okay, so this is the, the definition of the, the first variation of a functional f. Um, the first variation of f at mu, it's actually a, a function. So this is just like notation for the first variation, but this whole thing is a function that maps rd to r. And it will capture like the first order change of f in the following sense. If I consider any perturbation chi, which integrates to zero, the reason why I'm considering integrates to zero is I want to stay within probability measures, right? Um, then if I look at the functional f evaluated at mu plus epsilon times this perturbation, it should be f of mu plus the first order term is the integral of this first variation and the perturbation. Okay, so what, what does this say? It says that... Um, if I differentiate the functional along some curve mu t, this should be exactly the first variation integrated with respect to the like um, time derivative of the density of mu t, right? Because like this this time derivative of the density of mu t that is like the the perturbation I'm making to the, the measure. Okay, so we, we have this definition of first variation, and then from this definition, we're going to be able to find what is the Wasserstein gradient of f. So recall the definition up there. What I need to do is I need to I identify an element of the tangent space that satisfies this for all curves, mu t. So let's uh, fix some curve mu t v t. Okay, where like v t is the tangent vector to mu t. What I want to do is I, I need to compute the left-hand side of that expression, the time derivative of f at time t equals zero. And then I need to then like compare what I get here to the right-hand side of that definition to identify the bus density. Okay, but you see like this definition of first variation tells me how to compute this derivative of f. So the, the time derivative of this functional is going to be the first variation of f at mu and then like the the time derivative of the density of mu at, at zero. Okay, but what you need to remember is like what does it mean for vt to be the the tangent vector to mu t? It means that we have the continuity equation. Do I still have the continuity equation? No. Oh, here. Perfect. The continuity equation. Masterfully planned. So, so I could substitute in the continuity equation, and that will give me a minus divergence of 
mu and d0. OK, now I, I want this to, to equal uh, something like the right-hand side. So what, what I'm going to do is integrate by parts. to like bring the divergence over. So when you bring the divergence over, so remember like this first variation is a function on RD. So I can take its gradient. So I get the, the gradient of the first variation, inner product with V0, and then D mu. And now we've arrived at precisely the right-hand side of that, of that definition. So actually, this is the Wasserstein gradient. It's the gradient of the first variation, like the Euclidean gradient of the, the first variation. Uh, what, one other thing I should mention is that this first variation is actually only defined up to an additive constant because this chi integrates to zero. So I can add any constant to this first variation and I'll still satisfy the definition. So this first variation is, is defined up to added a constant, but when we, when we take the gradient, that ambiguity disappears. Okay, so also like this calculation checks that, that bottom equation in the definition of, of, uh, of a Wasserstein gradient, but there's another aspect to the definition of Wasserstein gradient, which is that the thing which I identify as the Wasserstein gradient, it should belong to the tangent space. So why do we know that it belongs to, to the tangent space? Well, it's because it's a gradient of a function. We said the tangent space is the space of gradients of function. Okay, so this is all good. We've, we've computed what the first variation is. I think I'll still need a continuity equation. Okay, um, now that we've seen this, I think I don't need this anymore. Let's see what time is it? Oh. Sorry, I, I meant to give you guys a, a break, but um, but for the sake of time, let's just let's try to finish the, the gradient calculation. Um, okay, so this gives you like an abstract kind of procedure for calculating the Wasserstein gradient of whatever function, but it's still like very abstract, so we don't know like how to actually use this. So let's compute the Wasserstein gradient of a specific functional, which is going to be the KL divergence. And it's the KL divergence in the first argument with respect to the target distribution pi. Yep. Uh, sorry, uh, coming back to the definition of the, the perturbation, uh, sorry, the, um, the first variation, mm -hmm. uh, you, you define it as a function from R to R, and you'd say for any perturbation X, but uh, what the perturbation, what, uh, what is it? Is it uh, a vector field? Is it what? A uh, vector field is a function from... The, uh... the perturbation is also a function from RD to RD. It's like okay. the perturbation of the density itself. Okay. So if I change from a probability density mu to some other probability density, then the difference between the de two densities is a function which integrates to zero. Okay, so, so when you write um, mu plus uh, epsilon x, uh, means that uh, you perturbate the density of mu. Yes. It's suspected. Yes. Okay. I, I add this perturbation directly to the density. Okay. And when you write uh, dx, uh, you mean respect to the the new chi. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Um, I probably shouldn't okay. confuse you with this. Let me just write like i here. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah. The the reason why why about d chi is because like. The perturbation of a measure is actually a measure, so you, uh, a signed measure, so you can integrate with respect to chi, but um, let, let's just think about density. So it's just going to be the integral of 
the product of the frustration and, and the perturbation. Okay. Okay. Well, it is the variation, but evaluated on chi, or it is a. Uh... So no, no, no. So this is just a function. Okay. And the point is product. Okay. And this is also a function. Okay. So I, I multiply these two functions okay. point-wise, and then I, I okay. integrate. And do you integrate with respect to? The vague measure. The vague, okay, perfect. Okay. Thank you. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, is this better? Thank you, yes. Okay, sorry. Okay, so we'll be looking at this functional. And what is the definition of the KL divergence? It's log of d mu d pi integrated with respect to d mu. OK, but um, remember, like from the first lecture, the, the distribution pi I'm interested in has density e to the minus v. So log of 1 over pi is going to be v. So when you plug that into here, uh, this KL divergence has a very nice form. It could be written as a sum of two terms. The first one is the integral of v with respect to mu. And the second one is the integral of mu log mu. And these two terms, this is called the, uh, like the potential energy. I, don't know how to write this without it looking really ugly. But this is supposed to be like a curly V applied to mu. I'm viewing this as a functional of mu. And the second term is the, the entropy. OK, this is the, uh, I guess like in physics, this would be the negative of the entropy. But um, we'll, we'll just call this the entropy. This is like nice because it's, it's convex. Mm. Yeah, let's let's keep the rest. Okay, so I'm going to erase this but keep some important stuff. So the the two the two things that we'll need are uh the first variation was equivalent to saying that the time derivative of the functional along a curve is just going to be um, the integral of the first variation times the time derivative of the density. So that's kind of the definition of the first variation. The second thing we'll need is that the Wasserstein gradient is the Euclidean gradient of the first variation of F. OK, so what we're going to do is we're just going to compute the, the first variation of each of these two terms. And then we're going to take the Euclidean gradient of these first variations to find the Wasserstein gradients. So let's do this first for v. So to find the first variation, let's just use this. So what, what is the time derivative of, of this functional v along some curve? So this functional v is just the integral of v uh, integrated with respect to mu t. So if I pass the time derivative inside the integral, this is just the integral of v with respect to the, the derivative of the density. And now you, you compare this with the definition of the, the first variation. And you see like the, the first variation of this functional is pretty simple. The first variation of, of this curly v is just v itself. Okay, very, very simple. And also like this first variation doesn't actually depend on mu. Okay, so what does that tell us? It tells us that the Wasserstein gradient of V is the Euclidean gradient of V.
Okay, uh, just, just one more functional to go. Let's compute the uh, first variation of the entropy. So what is the time derivative of the entropy along the curve? This is the time derivative of the integral of mu t log mu t. Oh, sorry, um, one, one little mistake I made. Okay, so one, one quick mistake I made is that this pi was only proportional to e to the minus v. So this is not equal to v, but it's actually like plus a constant here, depending on the constant proportionality. There's also a plus constant here, but this constant is not really going to affect the, the gradients. Yeah. Okay, let, let's go back to the computation of this entropy. So uh, what is the, the derivative of mu log mu with respect to mu? Log, log mu plus one. So when you do the chain rule, you'll just get log mu plus one times the derivative of mu. So that's the, the chain rule. Okay, so now if you compare with the definition of first variation, we found our first variation. The first variation at mu is log mu plus one. But remember, I said that the first variation is defined up to additive constant, so this, this plus one doesn't really matter. Anyway, we're going to take the gradient. Oops, I guess I should say this is uh, entropy. Okay, so the, the Wasserstein gradient of the entropy is just the gradient of log mu. Okay, so now, now let's identify the gradient flow of the KL divergence. It's just the curve whose tangent vector is minus the Wasserstein gradient of the KL divergence. And the gradient of the KL divergence is just a sum of these two gradients that we've computed. Okay, but what does it mean for the for VT to be the tangent vector to this curve? Well, it means that mu t VT should satisfy the continuity equation. So let's plug this into the continuity equation to see what uh, what dynamics we get from mu. The time derivative of mu t plus the divergence of mu t times v t, but v t is the minus gradient. The minus gradient has has two terms. Minus grad v minus grad log mu t equals zero. So that's from the continuity equation. And then I still have on the upper left the, the Fokker Planck equation. So now you can compare the, the Fokker Planck equation that we derived for the Langevin diffusion with the Wasserstein gradient flow of the KL divergence. And you'll see that they're the same equation. So this tells us that the the law of the Langevin diffusion is evolving as the gradient flow of the KL divergence in the space of measures with this uh, Wasserstein distance. So there's there's about like 10 minutes left, but I think this is a pretty good place to like stop. And if you have questions, then... Uh, uh, let me also like uh, say a few more references. Um, yeah, let me let me write these down really quickly because this is important. Uh, where to write it up here? So, like I guess like the the paper that people attribute this this viewpoint of Langevin to is is this well known paper by uh, Jordan Kinderler. and auto. It's called like on the variational formulation of the, the Fokker Planck equation. So that's that like the second of the two like really nice papers. Um, and I didn't get to the, the third. 
thank you, Sino. Uh, so if you have uh, comments, questions, uh, curiosities, uh, please, uh, there is 10 minutes left. So if you have uh, questions, please. Okay, perhaps this is a question maybe related to something because I, I didn't check much literature recently. So, but if you start uh, from the stochastic differential equation, is there a way to put it as a, I mean, pathwise in a pathway sense as a sort of gradient flow? Or, uh, um... or maybe let, let's put it in this way instead of looking at the law of the solution. You look a sort of empirical laws of the solution. Say so you you run a lot of inde <laughs> of independent uh, solutions, and then you do the empirical laws. You meet the singular measures. Maybe it's related to the fact that when you have singular measures, the tangent is not uh, is not the one described here by Otto Calculus. So I have not um I have not seen anything like that in general. Like for for any particular dynamics, like you can try to interpret it in, in lots of different ways. Um, but like the, the reason why we care about Wasserstein is that this interpretation has proven to be particularly useful uh, for like analyzing the Langevin, like un understanding like the algorithms. Also, it's just like very, like, I guess, natural. So uh, this this paper by Otto where in, in on the porous medium equation, that's pretty nice because, because it's like the first paper that introduces this this Riemannian structure of, of Wasserstein space, he also needs to justify why this is a useful thing to do. So he like he gives like a number of reasons there. And one of the reasons is that this kind of separates out two parts of the Langevin diffusion. One is thermal dynamics, which is captured in the objective function, the KL divergence. And the second part of the Langevin diffusion is the geometry of the base space, which is uh, reflected reflected by the, the geometry of Wasserstein space. The, the objective and the metric like separate out thermodynamics and, and geometry. But that's like an, um, another reason why this is particularly nice. And there's a, there's a lot you could say about, about this subject. Okay, you have any other questions? Not I have a question. So my question is, uh, as you say, the, the point of view of continuity equation uh, which it's it's it's, uh, it's somehow the, the 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 natural one when when you're doing proofs or something like that. It's it's the the one uh, by testing uh, with functions. So what happens if you discretize this, meaning that you take just a bunch of uh, of files and then can you, in some sense, I don't know, characterize something about uh, a discrete the discretized. Uh, uh, equation discretized gradient flows, but uh, from the, this viewpoint, uh, like you want it to only hold for some like finite dimensional space of functions or something like that. No, I've not seen anything like that. That's an interesting question. I guess like it might be related to looking at submanifolds of, of the Wasserstein space or something. Um, yeah, also, like it reminds me of one one interesting conceptual point, which is like. We started off with a stochastic differential equation, but through this like continuity equation interpretation, we see that uh, if you follow like this vector field, minus grad v minus grad log mu t, you just trace out the integral curves of this vector field, then the evolution of law exactly reproduces the evolution of law of, of the Langevin diffusion. Like may maybe a quick picture is like, uh, imagine that I have a bunch of particles and I evolve by the Langevin diffusion, then these particles are going to go crazy because it's uh, following Brownian motion. And then you, you end up with this, right? With, with some other collection of particles. But what this perspective is saying is that you can take this, this, uh, this collection of particles and order their movement. So they all follow the, this, like, this specific vector field. And now the trajectories are going to be really orderly, but you still end up with the same evolution of, of distributions. So that is like where the optimal part of optimal transport enters the picture. 
So this, this has also been very inspirational for people who want to try to discretize these dynamics with uh, deterministic processes rather than stochastic ones. Okay, thank you again. So 